there is a uh, there is a proverb in Hebrew. Uh, it goes, it's better in Hebrew. The makom the makom the makom she'en ish is a herring a fish in a place. It doesn't rhyme in English, but when there's no personage, then even a herring is a real fish. So, uh, I'm here. Okay, uh, we will hear uh, three <laughs> lectures in the next hour and a half. Uh, the first speaker is Thomas Jankowski who wrote a very interesting doctoral thesis, one of the most important uh, theses I have read in recent years on Jews in Poland and on demography. Don't worry, it says in the Talmud, that you, in front of a person you only say part of the praise. That's only a little part. The rest I won't say. But it's a very, very important book called Demography of a Shtetl, the case of Piotr Kuv Tribulanski. Tri, uh, yeah, Tribulanski. It's a family reconstruction of the entire Jewish population of Piotr Kuv for an extended period and enables you a per, to see not cases, but an entire population. And it's a basis for everything who, dealing with family structure, family history in the region. Uh, it was published by Brill two years ago, and uh, for those who are interested, it can be downloaded from the Brill site. And if you don't have access to the Brill site, then find somebody who does have access, and they can <laughs> download it for you. Thank you. And if you cannot find somebody who has access, that means that you are not a real scholar. Real scholars know how to find somebody who has connections. <laughs> so uh, he will speak on the topography of Ashkenazi urban and rural demographic continuum. I would explain it to you, but he'll do a better job. <laughs> so the, the word transmade uh, became very popular in recent years in uh, Academy, just a month ago, there was a conference in the Pauline Museum, East Central Europe at the crossroads, Jewish transnational networks and identities. I think one of the most popular now history book on the history of Ukraine is, is the global history of Ukraine. Another book which you all know is uh, Bloodland. So there is this, this general need to undermine the existing borders, to cross the borders and possibly to question the existing um, narratives and the existing cognitive um, paradigms. Uh, but to be honest, when I, before I applied to this conference, I, I was wondering what transimperial means, and my, my dictionary wasn't very sure about that. <laughs> <laughs> Still, <clears throat> I hope I can Today, I can show you with some demographic data uh, how we can challenge the existing existing borders, borders, actual political borders on the map, and the borders that limit our uh, cognitive uh, skills. And, and one thing we can agree for sure all is that history needs more specialization. That means we need to go from macro perspective to mezzo or micro perspective to, to get rid of those, those over generalizations. And when we think about Jewish history, it's, it's especially important for, for, for this part of the academic scholarship because it's very difficult to find another group of people that would maintain continuity for over 2,000 years, and that would be united by, to a large extent, by religion slash, slash national aspect. So, so very often when we go to universities, we have 
Jewish, Jewish studies, which deal with completely different regions, but st still we consider it as a one, one branch of the scholarship. So, and demography played very important role in building this macro perspective, because uh, as a scholarship, it was developed in late 18th century as a part of the Enlightenment, and it was a tool to, for what, what Foucault calls biopolitics, to impose central, uh, some specific characteristic upon residents to make them citizens of a state. So um, it was a demography was a political tool to create what can be perceived by someone who is like outside the scholarship as some something like positive the objective reality, which is not. And the most like um, popular example, typical example of this how demography as a scholarship, how censuses may be manipulative, is that in the Habsburg uh, censuses, there was no option to, to report the Yiddish as your mother language, only, only German. Another example of this political issue is that, for example, in 1772, the governor of Brno reported that in the, according to the census enumerated in that year, 1772, there was a, the total abundance of males, females, and Jews. So even so, even this this what what seems very clear to us as a, as a gender differences wasn't so sure at the end of 18th century. And the, the most recent example connected also to gender is the census that took place two years ago in in Poland, where there was not only option to report your gender that is other than male or female, but this, this specific characteristic was pre-filled pre by, by the census takers already based on the national data. So, so the entire part of the population was excluded, either those who changed uh, sex or, or maybe wanted to report some other sex than male or female. Mm. So, yeah, so let me show you a table from a book from, uh, by Della Pergola uh, from 1983. And this table shows typical issues with the demographic scholarship that was and still is uh, dominating uh, in the Jewish, not only in the Jewish studies, but in general, when we have no, no sufficient information. So, so maybe you could, uh, this is not an, a scan, but it's an exact copy. So uh, maybe you could point some, some issues that we have here. It's a, I don't know, I, I'm not a specialist in Italian, but this is the, um, the changes in fertility and mortality in Poland from 1882 to 1930, at least what the table claims. But what, anybody wants to point the, what are the generalizations here? So one is that De La Pergola takes data from Galicia from 1882 and compares it to Galicia or Warsaw in 1930. So, and then he claims it re it's representative for the entire Poland. So we have here two, two issues already. The third issue is that we don't know exactly what are the differences in the territory that we, the Poland of 1882, there was, somebody could say that there was no Poland here, there was Congress Poland, there was, I don't know, Galicia, and, and then we compare it to completely different territory in 1930. But you know, considering the availability of the data for the 19, uh, in the 1983, De La Pergola did what he could for that time. But now we have better tools. Now we have quick computers, and now we have access to the archives, and we can collect the microdata. Microdata that is the information on the individuals from from the censuses. So we don't take the aggregated results, 
but we go, if it's possible, and in some cases it's possible, in many cases it's possible, but we go directly to the original information recorded by the census take taker when he visited the, when he visited the, um, the household. And for a long time it was believed that the, there is no microdata available for the Jews, or very few. In fact, I was able to collect the 18th century data, microdata on over 100,000 Jews for the East Central Europe. That means 10% of the population. And I dare to say it's much more than information than we can collect on the non-Jews. So, so maybe because Jews were of special interest to the uh, enlightening states at the time, the information was better preserved in the in the archives. Um, so let me show the map of the distribution of the data I work with for the late 18th century. And it's good for this conference because it's, it comes from different uh, empires, different states. We have to begin with that side. Uh, some information from uh, Bohemia, 1792, Mm, that is the Habsburg Empire. We have some information from the right before the collapse of the Poland Lithuania from the Sierac uh, Voivodeship, the Blue Rats, and the Krakow Voivodeship, uh, Voivodeship 1790, 1792 data. Uh, we have lots of information from the 1764 census from Rafinia or what just a few year, years later became Eastern Galicia. And we have uh, some information from Northern Bukovina, from 1783, right? So, uh, yeah, so that's already the part of the Habsburg Empire, but seven years earlier it was still the Ottoman Empire. So we can say you know, demography is not something that changes within seven years, and it's, it's a good, good point of uh, reference. And of course, there is the Podolia data and, and Kiev data from 1795, which is just a two years after, the, uh, after those, those uh, lands were annexed by the Russian Empire. Mm. So we can compare the, we can compare how Jews differed, how Jewish demography differed at the end of 18th century, we could say either within the Habsburg Empire here or within the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth at the edge of the partitions. Okay, let's see. And I take to to basic variables, demographic variables, that is age at marriage for females, and that is important because at the time when there were no widespread contraceptive, this uh, age at marriage was the primary way to limit fertility uh, in the population, and the household naturalization, that is a measure that here I use, in which here I use the lastlet structure and the nuclear, nuclear households are those which are no family household or single family household, that is mother, father and children or just a uh, couple or just a widowed, uh, widowed uh, parent. Mm. And what we can see here, we can see first of all that there is lots of variability. Uh, between all those different regions. Uh, let's start with Bohemia. Bohemia has the, obviously most, the age at marriage was the, the highest of, out of all the regions that I researched, uh, but it was like in the middle when it comes to the nuclear, nuclearization. Mm, Galicia, Eastern Galicia or Rastania, is, is with the lowest age of marriage and the highest level of multiple family households. 
But what is interesting, the, what became, largely became Western Galicia is quite on the opposite side. So we can see already that even before, uh, even, even before the annexation, uh, annexation of these lands by the Austrian Empire, within what we tend to think like Galicia, there was like one land, there is an important variability. And even before Galicia became Galicia, there is huge difference between Western and Eastern, Eastern Galicia, between Krakow and Rathenia. And on the other hand, Podolia and Kiev regions, quite reasonably, are very close, with low age of marriage and medium nuclearization. But you could say, on the other hand, that Podolia was also a part of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, for, for, for a few decades at the end of 17th century. It didn't change a lot. Um, and surprisingly, Sherat's region, which is close to Krakow, uh, is even more nuclearized. There, were, there are very, very few households with multiple families. And, uh, and why, why nuclearization is important, let me add this piece, it's because, it's because nuclearization is a way to, in which the work relationship reflects in the, in the households. According to the, like the classical, classical theory developed by Laszlet, the, the more nuclearized household is, the more service we need to provide the additional work that is required in a household, in a household at that time, which was the basic economic uh, unit. But you could say, why is that? Why, why, why it happens so? And uh, you could say there are significant differences between urban and rural uh, populations in that region. So let me, let me show you, this is more messy, but I will guide you through. Let me show you the differences between urban and rural uh, population within that region. And you can, it's very, to me, it's very logical. It's, what changes is not the age of marriage, but the nuclearization. Age of marriage remains within the region more or less the same. So let's take Kiev, for example, region. The age of marriage is more or less the same, but what changes is the nuclearization. And again, we have those pairs, vertical pairs, Podolia, Galicia, it's, what changes is only the y-axis, and Krakow region. Um, there is very little difference in, in Bohemian. I think this is, uh, except for all, and, and Bukovina, this is the only one uh, exception. That in other words, there are very few, at least from the point of demography, but I think it reflects also the, the more general truth about the difference between rural and urban population in those two, two regions, Bohemia, there are very few differences. We could say, we could say why, and, and uh, you know, I, it's hard to say, it's, as, a, as a demographer, I would like to answer based on the statistic information, and in a statistic, statistical <laughs> relevant way, but it's not, it's, it's difficult, and uh, we could say, speculate that, you know, in a, if, if in case the differences are very, very small, then we could say that the population was migrating constantly between villages and, and, and urban areas, and that's why it wasn't, a, a, it wasn't possible to develop the demographic differences. And on the other hand, we could say that in Podolia, Kiev region, Galicia, Krakow, the, the differences were huge, because there was an other need to develop the, the work relationships in, in the rural, uh, rural areas. And that might be the answer why in the rural areas there was more need to have multiple family households. Is, this is typical uh, arenda in but it wasn't only an end, it was much, much more. It's a small entrepreneurship in the in Ukrainian village. Uh, this is a picture from Yarishi. Of course, it's the beginning of the 19th, 20th century, but uh, the building itself is probably from 18, 
century, early 19th century. And we see this is not a re regular household. This is a huge, huge uh, hotel entrepreneurship with several houses within the compound. And it's not possible to run such a place having just one nuclear family. So this is one the non-statistical expl explanation of what uh, of what happens here. And but that's just a part of the story. There is we can see how the data changed until the end of 19th century. And I have the data for those few regions for the late uh, 19th century. And we can see how those points moved and. What do you think? Where Galicia will be at the end of 19th century? Where this point will move here? Will we have higher age of marriage and higher nuclearization level? Or maybe the same age of marriage? Somebody wants to suggest an answer. You mean rural Eastern Galicia? This is uh, urban Galicia. Urban and rural. I don't have the data for rural Galicia. For, Higher age of marriage. Yes, and, <laughs> and, and more nuclearization. That's right. But what is surprising <laughs> is that Galicia oh, yeah. becomes almost at the same point where Bohemia is. That is, those two two regions in the Habsburg Empire suddenly become very similar, at least when we take age of marriage and nuclearization, while Podolia and, and Kiev region, which became a part of the Russian Empire, the age of marriage changes, of course, it rises, but not so dramatically as in Galicia, uh, but the nuclearization is, is, you know, is more or less uh, the same. It's not a dramatic jump. Yes, so we can see how how regions which were very close on the map suddenly becomes very distant when we take other dimensions other than latitude and, and, and longitude. So so let me let me uh, conclude. I want you I want you to think about this graph as a, as a maps and, and new dimensions that help us to get rid of those political borders. And, and we can see that there's a lot of variability at the end of 18th century. And we could say there is nothing like Eastern European Jewish family. There are Jewish, different Jewish family models already at the end of century, 18th century. And, the, um, and, and there is maybe not even such a thing as traditional family, because there is a lot of change in the 19th century, during the 19th century, and a lot of variability at the end of 18th century. So if that happens, if we have not only one Jewish demography, but Jewish demographies, it's also because of the empires and the different environments, political, cultural environments they bring in. Thank you. After hearing a lecture like this, you have to wonder, how can anybody say that demography is boring? <laughs> this is, thank you very, very much. You made it exciting. Uh, the next speaker is Johannes Chakai. Are you here? Yes, you are. Uh, <laughs> who wrote a doctorate that was published as a book Nochem's Neue Namen, Nochem's New Name, uh, which sounds interesting. And then it goes on, the Jews of Galicia and in Bukovina and their uh, adoption of German pro uh, surnames and family names between 1772 and 1820. So that's a long title, but this is a very, very important study of social history and also administrative history. And this uh, was published, and I forgot the publisher, which is the publisher? Weinstein. Weinstein. But if you look around on the internet, you can <laughs> find it. And that is a high compliment to the author. I looked and 
mine, nobody was interested in posting mine, but yours made it. So I think take it as a blessing. Now, that's the book. But how about the most recent article of Bug Crushers and Barbaric Clerks, The Fabricated History of Jewish Family Names in the Works of Karl Emil Franzos. And this appeared in the Leo Beck uh, yearbook uh, last year, which also can be downloaded. And this is a guarantee that we are going to have something interesting. I hope so. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, thank you also to Tomas and talking about uh, your uh, your love for microhistory because I will continue also a little bit with microhistory. Um, yeah, so let me start. Um, as most of you know, um, at the end of the 18th century, the Habsburg administration under Joseph II pursued the policy of turning rural Jews in Galicia into <coughs> farmers. These agricultural endeavors were never a huge success and declined very soon. Accordingly, the research literature is very limited, which is surprising because uh, these Galician Jewish colonies were the first state endeavors of their kind in the modern era. Therefore, in my presentation today, I want to shed some light on the topic and especially encourage new research because I have to clarify here, this is, not, this is only a side project of mine. This is not what I do usually, um, but I came across this topic during the research of my PhD uh, thesis where I collected every name list I could find in Galicia. And so it caught my interest. And especially, uh, it made me, I was interested in that because um, so far we only have numbers when it comes to farming in Galicia, but we don't have the actual uh, people that were um, involved. So therefore, I will present today um, unknown archival uh, sources, and I will especially highlight the value of, of name lists. Um, I think Judith Kalik also um, stressed the importance of that in, in Vilna. Minsk, Minsk, Kobania, yes. So the general idea of Jewish farming in Galicia was based on two principles, the expulsion of rural Jews from the villages and the physiocratic idea of agriculture as the base uh, for the wealth of the state. At the time of the acquisition of Galicia, the Habsburg administration regarded rural Jews as the reason for everything bad in the province, especially the alcoholism of the peasants. 30% of the Jewish population lived in villages in eastern Galicia, which was dominated by private towns and um, domains, or manors, even 43%. A look into the detailed censuses of Zelestchiki and Jasrowiec, which I presented last year at the World Congress, shows that indeed almost every village in the vicinity of both communities had Jewish inhabitants, and we just saw the picture of a typical um, arenda. So usually that was the leaseholder or in German, arrendator, with a family, innkeepers, tavern keepers, servants, distillers, sometimes private teachers. And the Habsburg administration wanted to change that. So this policy of uh, turning rural Jews into farmers uh, can be divided into two stages. The first stage started around 1785 and is characterized by state-supported colonization on state-owned and private land. And from 1789 onward, uh, colonization uh, was financed by the Jewish communities. I start with the first stage. Early on, the state legislature began to expel Jews from the villages by prohibiting leases of all kinds, distilleries, inns, taverns, mills, market fees, and so on. Accordingly, rural Jews lost their income and had to leave the villages. At the same time, the emperor expressed his desire to turn Galician Jews into farmers, like the Karaites that he encountered there, in order to make them useful for the state. Simultaneously, the Habsburg administration supported the settlement of German farmers in Galicia, so they had some experience with colonization. Um, yeah. okay. um, and as with the German colonists, Joseph II encouraged the establishment of farming colonies for Jews. Since 1785, the state granted tax reliefs for Jewish families uh, wishing to go into farming, provided help with the establishment, money, construction material, and even allowed Jews to purchase land. 
Furthermore, owners of private and royal estates were encouraged to facilitate the settlement of Jewish farmers, either in colonies or individual, individually. The first actual attempt of establishing a Jewish farming colony organized by the state was in 1785 in Dombrovka near Novosanj and was called New Jerusalem. The second one, probably founded in October 1786, uh, right next to Bolechov, uh, was named New Babylon. Simultaneously, also Jewish communities or entrepreneurs approached the administration and proposed new colonies, although it's hard to say uh, which of these proposals were meant seriously. But despite all these efforts um, and despite the support from the emperor, the local administration saw these endeavors as futile and tried to sabotage uh, them. Accordingly, most projects were declined or delayed by the state authorities um, because, in general, the administration uh, invested much less into these Jewish uh, farming colonists than into German farmers. So now we'll go a little bit more uh, into detail and to show more the problems uh, that we face here. Although some of you might have probably heard the names New Jerusalem and New Babylon before, uh, we do not have many details on the history. For example, who actually came up with these names? Um, I tried to uh, get some data, so for example, I have the list of the first Jewish settlers there, but I will look into another colony, which hasn't been the subject of research yet. And that's Arwamowska Bola, Novola Alamowska, and today's uh, Alamiska Bolia. Um, yeah, right at the, at the border to Poland. Uh, that was founded in 1786. Uh, on the private ground of a certain Count Zetna. The contract promised that each of the 17 families was provided with 25 korets inheritable land, a house, a barn, a stable, two cows, two horses, farm equipment and grain. The building material was expected to be repaid after 10 years. Uh, the Jews were urged to only work in farming and prohibited from uh, engaging in any kind of trade. And I have a list here of the first settlers in this place, um, 17 families, most of which, um, most of the colonists, 15 out of 17, were born in the, in the area, in the vicinity of the village, not more than 25 uh, kilometers uh, away from our Moscow border. All of them are children, and it's unclear to me what exactly their occupations were before, because as we can see here, um, they came not only from villages, but also like Karakovets, uh, from, from little towns. And that was actually uh, the place where the count uh, also had his manor. So I don't really know if all of them were rural Jews, if these uh, names refer to the actual place where they were born and lived, or just um, to the next place. Uh, so I'm, I don't really know. However, after two years, in July 1789, Three of the farmers, um, Le Perschenhorn, Hirsch, uh, Schildhaus, and uh, Jud uh, Charetz, um, wrote in the name of all the families in the pro uh, to the provincial government. They write that they were thankful for the soil they were given, but complained about its bad quality and about their landlord. Count Zetna, who would oppress them, did not fulfill his part of the contract with providing seeds, tools, and buildings and expected them to pay a possible interest. The district chief of Chemisch, Vincent von Schoper, investigated and agreed that the soil was, quote, very bad, sandy, and marshy, that the well was not ready, and that not everyone got their crops and tools. According to a survey, it would have been impossible to feed 73 people and pay the debts and interest. Oh, by the way, this is how the survey, the original survey looked like. Just want to give an impression of that. Um, however, he attested that the colonists could use the gardens and already grew, he writes, Zoginis, so I think that's Zucchini. Um, also, the barns were completed. He criticized the count, who did not deliver enough seeds and was therefore responsible for the bad harvest, and who requested the removal of the colonists several times. Therefore, the district official said, the only option was to calculate if the colony would be profitable and decide accordingly if the colonists should be removed. However, he also showed compassion for the colonists and wrote, it seems extraordinarily cruel that people who have been settled in the worst of places 
who are very badly equipped and who have been only very tepidly supported in their farms should be left to their fate and chased away as beggars. Accordingly, he concluded that they should be given some what, three years to repay the landlord and that it had to be evaluated every, every year after every harvest in the coming years if the colony seems to improve or not. And if not, they had to be uh, removed. Also, although it's um, unknown so far when exactly the end of this colony came, we can assume uh, that it <coughs> My circumstances did not improve without any help, um, and that the colonists were ultimately expelled very soon. What we learn in our Mofska Bola is similar to New Jerusalem and New Babylon, where the authorities declined support and where it must have been impossible for the Jewish colonists to actually establish themselves. Both colonies failed, and the ground was given to German settlers. Um, and interestingly, in our Moscow Wolle, the state authorities seemed much more supportive, showed compassion and confirmed the problems with the landlord. So this case demonstrates how important it is uh, further, to look further into the details and also um, to reassess the role of the nobility. Okay, let me continue. Yeah, I don't have the spreadsheet here, I'm sorry. But so um, we talked until now about colonies and we imagine somehow um, closed settlements. However, a survey, which I don't have here right now, I'm sorry, um, shows that at the end of 1786, there were 183 Jewish colonist families in Galicia, living in 92 villages. Of these, only three villages had more than nine Jewish farmers. That means the number of the Jewish farmers in the other 89 villages ranged between one and four. Closed colonies were therefore the exception where the vast majority lived alone in villages on private land. A good place to look further into these uh, single village farmers is Lviv or Lemberg um, and the villages in its vicinity, respectively. A survey, this survey here from 18, uh, 1793 of the Jewish farmers uh, who lived in private properties uh, shows that there were 21 families all of which have been registered as farmers between 1790 and 1791. Interestingly, for some of them, um, we have also some entries in other sources, especially the family books of 1785 and 1796, and so on. I was able to track some of the individuals uh, in several sources and see their developments. So let's have a look at this person here. I don't know if you can read it. Um, it's complicated. So this is Abraham Baumwald. He was born in Chishkov, and in 1785 he was a classical tavern keeper, or says here Schenker, uh, in Davidov. When you look at the maps here, this Lviv is over there. Uh, he was born in Chishkov, and then he worked in Davidov. So very close to where he was born. Uh, he didn't come from another area. Um, in 1785 he was registered under the name Abraham Tsch. Uh, which derived from his home village. If you want to know more about it, please read my book. Um, according to the family book, he was married, he had five children, a servant, a father-in-law, as well as a sister, so in total 10 people lived in this household. At the end of 1787, he had to change his name. Now his name was Abraham Baumwald, and also his occupation changed. So, due to the prohibition of Jewish uh, tavern keepers, he was now registered as a Bestandmann, which is a tenant, um, and a baker. At the beginning of 1790, he seems to have changed into a farmer. This is when he made this contract with, uh, with uh, um, the landlord. He received 20 coats land, but no house on no animals. So, apparently, he built his house by himself, and in 1793, it was written that he possessed his own house and his own land for indefinite time. However, this whole endeavor was not uh, fruitful. In 1794, um, Baumwald and his neighbor Markus Rotter, who also changed from a tavern keeper to baker to farmer, complained to the district office in Lemberg in, in very bad German, which I kind of tried to translate also into English. Um, undersigned, they, they speak about themselves as, as they. Undersigned are colonists who for four years have worked the land and paid all the taxes. But they were devastated due to bad harvest 
and they do not get help from the Kahal. Therefore, they ask for mild mercy in form of financial relief or for release from cultivating the land. The district office forwarded this, uh, the letter to the Jewish community, asking them to examine um, if Baumwald and Rotter could be supported. Although it's unknown to me if they received help or not, and how what happened in the end. What I found is that in 1790, ah, that's the signatures. Uh, what I found is that in 1796, that's the new family book, um, they were registered now Baumwald as baker and farmer in Davidov, and his neighbor Rotta, or not neighbor, but his acquaintance, uh, as an impoverished uh, Arnta, uh, Bauer, so, um, impoverished farmer in Cherepin. So this unfortunate development is also visible in the other farming families in the vicinity of Lviv, which are tracked also in the several sources. We see the typical uh, rural uh, occupations in 1785, so tavern keepers, leaseholders, and so on, um, then, when that was prohibited, we see that they tried to get into other occupations, then they registered it as farmers, and in 1796, some of them were still farmers, others uh, were impoverished, or changed to, to different um, occupations. Um, so what we see here is that the decision to become farmers was motivated by economic necess necessities. Jews who had lost their previous income had to search for new ways to survive. Farming was an opportunity, but not a good one, due to the lack of support from the communities, from the state authorities, and the landowners. Some contemporary critics have written that Jews only registered as farmers in order to purchase land, but what we see here is they did not want to have this land, they wanted to get rid of it. Okay, let me talk a bit about the second stage. Um, the low success of the private endeavors um, and the experience with the actual cost of the colonies convinced the administration to change the policy. In 1789, the authorities abandoned the original plan and pulled out of state funding for the project. Instead, they ordered Jewish communities to fund and establish the, the Jewish farmers with their own financial means. The plan was to fund 1,410 Jewish families all over the province, mostly the poor ones. They were not to be settled in colonies, but dispersed in villages among Christians. So there was a master plan how many uh, farmers every Jewish community had to establish according to the size of the community and also to support. The Lambert community, for example, was obliged to settle 105 families. Um, and yeah, the elders were not very excited about this financial burden, and um, for years they did nothing. So the Austrian administration reminded them multiple times to reach the targeted number and asked the districts to send annual summary reports. And they looked like this, uh, this annual summary uh, report, but we have to be careful here because when I found that, I was, it was very interesting that because the names were... The, these family names refer to farming. And I was like, oh, that's interesting, that's, that's a pattern. But only then I found out it's a, it's a template. These names do not exist. Um, so Mr. Fieldman doesn't, didn't exist, and this was um, yeah, only a template to see how these lists should look like, and we should be critical with our sources. Um, however, there are a lot of these lists which actually uh, depicted the, the real uh, developments and which were collected all over Galicia. Um, they were summarized into annual statistics for the whole province. And so far in the research literature, we only know one of those lists. Um, it's the one from 1803, which was printed in Maurice Levin's work on, on Galicia. Um, however, I could complement these statistics with my own uh, lists, which I found which were much more detailed than, than Levin's lists, especially because they contained names and often um, also the, the individual outcome of, of the settlement. I chose this page here because I thought maybe Professor Bartal would be here because that's the area we spoke yesterday about, the uh, Delatine area, but yeah. Um, at the first glance, so I compared these numbers and 
I want to, you to look at these numbers here. So the first number is the one that was supposed to, uh, like the, the communities were supposed to fulfill, 1,410 colonists. Um, so now we have the numbers for 18, 3, 4, and 5. And what we see at the first glance, it, it looks like, um, like a huge progress. Um, however, <laughs> the steady increase is uh, a bit difficult. And anyway, uh, actually, it's misleading in many ways. And I will demonstrate what I mean uh, by looking into the district of Zhukiev. This is an example of Zhukiev or Zhovka. Um, according to the 1803 list by um, Levin, um, the community had to settle 75 families. And as we can see, they fulfilled this goal. Um, however, when we look into the list that I have um, from 1804, 5, and 7, uh, it shows that a significant number, 41, that is 55% of the farmers, were not active in farming anymore. They had already left their farms, sold the ground, died, or you see, there are many possibilities. So only 34 out of the original 75 farmers were still living on their farms, and we see a similar declines, uh, similar decline in, in other districts. Another big problem in these statistics um, are, for example, um, the numbers from, from Lviv or Lemberg. Um, when we compare the numbers between 1803 and 1805, it looks like a huge progress. 130 families that were settled within two years and 104 of them came from the Lviv community. This is surprising because, as I said before, the community was not very interested in uh, spending community money for this project. In fact, in 1801, 57 poor local Jews even volunteered to become uh, farmers in the settlement project, but the community elders declined that request. Instead, they delegated the task and signed contracts with foreign Jewish entrepreneurs who promised to, to settle these 104 families. Very soon after, these entrepreneurs presented certificates that all required families were um, and indeed settled. However, several community members denounced that the certificates were false, and an investigation concluded that not a single family was settled. It was a scam. Uh, <laughs> the numbers were fabricated. That means that although these numbers are part of the official statistics. None of these 104 families were ever farmers. So what we learned from these examples is that we cannot trust any of the numbers and that the decrease of active farmers started much earlier than previously assumed. Um, I will rush a bit. <laughs> ah, that's... What does it tell about demographers? <laughs> <laughs> they have to answer that. Um, Okay, I will be fast now. So I want also to speak about the Bukovina, but I think I don't have much time, so I will be very brief here. Um, the development in Bukovina was different because of political uh, reasons. There, the, the whole project of turning rural Jews into farmers started earlier than in Galicia. Um, and what we have here is uh, that in 1783, uh, the military administration decided to classify uh, the Jewish population into uh, three occupational classes, farming, crafts, and trade, and expel everyone who was not um, in these classes. So it's a bit also what you described also in, in this later. Um, so that means the, they had the ambition of turning more than half of the population of, uh, of, of the Bukovina into farmers, which was very ambitious. Um, however, they face the same problems and the same nice lists later, which I will show here. Um, so a survey after, um, after 10 or 20 years uh, shows that less, like this is a list only of 31 uh, farming families from the district of Czernowitz. Um So I don't have better numbers, but this is a good one. So it shows that less of, uh, less than half of the farmers were still working as farmers in 1802. The others, yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't put that in a nice English spreadsheet, but the others were 
like before, they were still active in alcohol production and distribution. They were brewing, they were leaseholding, um, there was trade with cattle, wax, honey, one leased a mill. Some were old and not able to work, one drowned in the Dniester. Some emigrated to the Turkish territories in the south. Um, and the Jews who were found to be active in uh, other occupations than farming uh, were mostly resettled to towns or expelled from the province. However, we can see here that actually there were quite a few Jews who were still active in farming, even after 20 years. So I come to my conclusion. So like many other projects in Galicia, um, the policy of Jewish agricultural colonies and colonists was first and foremost an experiment. Its main purpose was to remove rural Jews from the villages and from the traditional manorial economy like leaseholding and alcohol distribution. But in practice, the project was never given a real chance. Instead of taking concrete efforts of establishing functioning agricultural colonies, the local administrations regarded the project as futile and too expensive. Rural Jews had mostly no desire to become farmers, but were trapped in this policy that aimed towards removing them from their traditional occupations without offering feasible alternatives. It is obvious that most chose farming only in order to prevent poverty and expulsion, but it mostly meant certain impoverishment. They were usually badly equipped, had no experience and relied on support. The agricultural endeavors affected only a small number of Galician Jews. As I said, it's 1,400 families. It's not much, but still, this episode shows um, how the big enlightened ideas uh, of the emperor were poorly implemented in the periphery. The lists I presented show how the state authorities tried to monitor this policy only to find out that they failed. We learn, therefore, quite a lot about the limits of state power but also about the agency of Galician Jews in a time of transition and upheaval. Um, they dealt with the new circumstances, uh, circumstances in creative ways. They often continued with petty trade and leases. They sold their properties, moved away, um, or some even engaged in farming. But however, generally the policy was a failure and did not create a new class of farming Jews in Galicia. However, I, saw, I hoped that I could demonstrate that this chapter of Jewish history is more complex than previously known. There are still many open questions which I cannot answer right now, but needs to be answered. Um, for example, the role of the nobility and also a lot of demographic uh, questions. Um, but however, I, in my presentation today, I hope that I could provide a little glimpse into the topic and I hope that I could show that it deserves a much more uh, that much more detailed analysis of the topic are needed. Thank you very much. Uh, this is one of those talks, I think, where the fact that the projects to change people against their will failed was rather predictable. How it failed is what really makes this very interesting. And I leave it to the listeners to think of a few contemporary parallels between great plans and different uh, results. Uh, the third speaker, the last of this uh, session, is uh, Nadia Skokova, who will speak on rural Jews of the Subcarpathian Eastern Galicia and the Jewish and non-Jewish political movements, Austrian and Polish periods. Uh, I did some research on Nadia, and I was not very successful, which... Uh, <laughs> rather upset me, so I wrote to her and asked her to send me what I should say about her. And here she is, a historian of modern East and Central Europe with a special interest in issues of mass politics, social changes in modern period, minority politics, and cultural transformations. Her PhD thesis, dedicated to the subject 
of the national modern transformation of Galician Jews in the interwar period. The East Galicia, the topic is the East Galician Zionist Federation, 1918-1929, formative ideology in building up modern Jewish society. That's the text that I got. What I found out afterwards is that Nadia has completed writing her doctoral dissertation, and only part left is the defense. So I think we will hear Nadia's talk, and we will all wish her a successful defense, and come back soon with those magic letters at the beginning of your name, Dr. Nadia Skokova. I can only say that when I received my doctorate, there was a little party at the house, and I had a daughter who was about three years old or four years old, and she asked, what, what is this party? And my wife said, you know, your Abba, your father, is a doctor now. And she looked and said, he's a doctor? He can't help anybody. <laughs> so... I wish you good luck and support, but remember that those are just letters at the beginning of your name. And even if you haven't had a defense, for us, you are a, already a doctor. <laughs> Nadia can actually help many uh, research fellows, you know, because she helped me at the archives of me very much to find material. <laughs> and I know a few professors who really cannot help anybody. <laughs> and worse than that, they're not willing to help anybody. So stay the way you are. Uh, after this broad presentation, uh, you already know my context. I came to this topic from the perspective of studying Zionist ideology in East Galicia. And uh, hopefully, I will defend my thesis. And currently, I, I have another project with, with which might help me to, to prove what I wrote before and to see on, the, uh, on this context more precisely. Uh, this is a project about rural Jews, and this project was provided by a Jewish, uh, a Jewish Galicia and Bukovina organization. This is like much more broader project than only this topic. And uh, especially today's talk is interesting because I try to reconsider what we usually think about political discourses and how political movement exists on the very, uh, very beginning of the societies in the rural areas where it's very hard to, uh, to provide proper political propaganda, to educate people and to uh, engage them to, to your political ideology. Um, talking from the perspective of uh, today's workshop, I try to reconsider how colonial approach is usually very rigid and uh, didn't, doesn't help to understand uh, a much broader perspective of human, uh, human existence. So, uh, in this particular uh, to uh, topic, I try to make another more broad, more broad approach, which is based on uh, new uh, archival sources and not determined to political uh, discourses. And usually it uh, answers the question how local Jews in villages try to help themselves. And uh, if it's possible to talk, that, to talk that Ukrainian and Jewish cooperation on the, uh, on the uh, rural level was uh, more successful than, uh, than we think it was more antagonistic. Um, because when we usually talk in perspective of colonial approach, usually one side try to prove is that they have much, uh, much developed programs which had very good uh, approval uh, among people, but usually it's not. And when uh, all this 
uh, all this academic narrative usually constructed to prove the, uh, the right to, to, to build on state and uh, uh, to have, or that we have, for example, a uh, distinct national identity or something like this. Uh, talking about uh, this topic, I try to, to ask new questions to the archival sources which uh, which before never was uh, uh, analyzed and to make a historical representation of uh, on a very low uh, level. Uh, so talking about uh, the uh, distinct uh, model, I would say, uh, of Subcarpathian rural Jews is possible because we have uh, we have a few aspects which uh, which collide in this uh, in this phenomena and we can uh, and we can discuss uh, Ukrainian Jewish uh, existence uh, on in productive way how they try to. Uh, not to live in antagonistic way, uh, but in more cooperative and to solve their own problems. When states usually are not very interesting to help for people at the very, uh, very provincial level. Um, probably it's, uh, it's going to be nice to emphasize that uh, interestingly, villages in Subcarpathian uh, region had higher population among Ukrainians and among Jew Jews. So this uh, uh, basically this analysis might provide a very good uh, observation how people can manage their lives and what. Uh, what tendency we can see during the long period of, of the exist, uh, existential coexistence. Uh, subject of my research is Subcarpathian, and in most cases I involve this uh, poet. Uh, this is a uh, north part of uh, Stanislavov Voivodeship, uh, and uh, it usually determined by a uh, low economic uh, initiative in this region and uh, the fact that um, in this region during the Polish period were basically zero involvement and still we can we can uh, trace how the traditional society answers for the modern tendencies and how they try to implement new ideas uh, in their lives. So when we talk when we talk about sources, is obviously the main problem that uh, we don't have uh, an authentic sources from the Jewish side. At least, is very few, and usually only uh, consider some persons. And everything we can rely is uh, sources provided by authority, local authority, and uh, uh, varieties of newspaper which local uh, villages read, and uh, newspaper which were popular, and, uh, uh, and that's it. So, uh, so outlining the main topic probably is good to emphasize that, uh, that we emphasize uh, the answering to questions. First of all is if we can talk about rural Jews as the distant, uh, distant term uh, in existence because from the very beginning, uh, as I try to show later, uh, they don't have the same ties with Kahal and with Shtetl as, religious, as traditional religious Jews should have. And uh, and that's why we we need uh, we can answer new questions and uh, try to speculate how uh, how being rural Jews uh, still can uh, 
keep the religious uh, religious and uh, traditional way, way of living, uh, despite the fact that they don't live in town. And another fact factor is to uh, to examine Ukrainian Jewish uh, coexistence because on because this region wasn't a classic uh, a classic model of triangle of existence, and at his uh, at, at this level, we can we can discuss how Jews were uh, and Ukrainians will live uh, on the um, anthropology on the level of just like one settlement. Uh, when we're talking about the idea of phenomenon of uh, rural Jews, we can we can argue that. Uh, this phenomenon started after the emancipation, when uh, when Jews can uh, can uh, go to the village and own uh, land or have some small properties there. And from the statistical data of Austrian period, we already can trace how much uh, Jews live in particular villages. Uh, however, when we talk about the level of politics on the uh, cooperative level, uh, we can even uh, uh, dig deeper and talk about the first uh, the first political interaction during the spring of uh, revolution uh, during the revolution of 1848. 1848. Thank you. And uh, it it was only a partially successful, but it gives us like uh, a new answers why Jews, uh, for example, supported or didn't support the idea of partitioning of Galicia. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, at like at my one of my opinions that uh, the absence of coherent uh, coherent um, communication with Kahal and and the local town was probably the main idea why rural Jews need to to create own way how they created cope with own problems because in local towns uh, Jews can only had the most important religious services but such question like cultural educational and uh, uh, and financial support never was uh, never was a question because usually uh, Jews in villages were very were very poor and they never was a part of uh, that part of Jewish society who can um, influence how the kahal budget uh, dispersed between uh, interest of community. When we talk about Austrian period, we can on, like I can only talk about the how, uh, for example, Zionist criticizes how Kahal system uh, existed at the time. But during uh, interval period, I already worked with authority document, and uh, I can state that uh, despite the fact that it was a national state, a modern state, when where only a kahal was a region, was a tool to um, to secure Jews in villages. Uh, kahal council never reflected how to help Jews to live in villages uh, uh, or provide any interests that uh, Jews in villages had. Um, so uh, talking from this perspective, uh, I state that um, Local rural Jews need to find the way to uh, to cope with their uh, needs without uh, without institution and do everything sporadically. Uh, what was very hard to do because the Carpathian uh, region was quite uh, was quite uh, backward and never had a good economic uh, support from the state or any uh, private initiatives. 
and basically and basically when we can talk about Jewish educational and cultural and political life in in villages it is it always was very local initiative because usually when we talk about how the modern political party uh, can reach as deep to to the very local level they usually uh, never had a good access to uh, to local uh, to local Jews, despite the fact that in interwar period the rural uh, Jews became very significant uh, percentage of people who can vote, and this part and this uh, percentage of uh, votes was very important to get place in parliament, and this is very uh, very important moment because uh, basically Jews from the villages cannot vote. Uh, on the local authority level, for example, in Kahal, but they can vote uh, and uh, to pick the political party to parliament. And here we can uh, observe very interesting tendencies that among uh, a variety of modern political party, only one, uh, General Zionists, uh, provided a political program for uh, to, to cope problems for the rural Jews. Uh, and that's, this is was the reason why uh, a million of oh, yeah. like a, a many many of many Jewish political part, parties never was was successive in, uh, in villages, but uh, general Zionists got the biggest support at that level. Uh, despite the fact that they uh, seldom can make a good initiative uh, to improve their life in villages. Uh, so when we talk about uh, how we can bound this uh, Ukrainian Jewish coexistence, despite the fact that usually we know about antagonistic narrative, how Jews and about rivalry between Ukrainian and Jewish societies. In most cases, uh, in Sub-Carpathian region, we can talk about coexistence uh, because uh, uh, usually, uh, usually it was uh, it was not as political uh, political question how we live there, but social and existential. Uh, and uh, people uh, found way to live together and to create own space, especially in small business uh, sector and um, in uh, it, when we uh, when we talk about, for example, uh, how the level of their existence were represented in Ukrainian newspaper, which were popular in this area, it never was antagonistic uh, to Jewish to, to local Jews. But the main uh, motive was that Jews as poor as we are, and we have the same uh, we have the same enemy. Usually, this was like state. And usually it was uh, it was rich people, and you can yeah. say the word Poles. Yeah. It's possible <laughs> here in Tel Aviv. Uh, <laughs> Poles. No, it was funny because usually they call it state, not even Poles. Yeah. Um, and this tendency was uh, this tendency was very coherent, and we can talk about it in Austrian period. Uh, John Paul Himka analyzed it in local newspaper of that time, and um, and I found a very interesting newspaper, very popular among Ukrainian uh, villagers, Hromadki uh, Holos. It was one of the most popular newspaper at this region, and uh, Jewish seldom uh, Jews seldom was uh, outlined as some enemy. They always was at the same side of uh, poor burden and all this 
uh, classic motifs why we why it's hard to live together and usually these newspapers even depicted how it was hard to be a poor Jew when a rich Jew also can make some uh, uh, privilege to to from from your poor existence. Uh, it was not very much uh, anti-Semitic uh, articles on and very interesting tendencies that it was not anti-Semitic towards Jews in general, but to very to very uh, particular name always. Like um, so, and interesting fact that all this uh, all this uh, antagonistic. Uh, coexistence even <laughs> never became worse when when the economic situation worsened. Even during the hardest period in uh, during uh, during 30s, uh, Ukrainian and Jews were still depicted as uh, the same. Uh, the same uh, victims of circumstances. Uh, another interesting, uh, another interesting aspect uh, co regarded that uh, I found, uh, I found uh, data that in village, in council, uh, in village councils, usually were, uh, were a big number of Jews. Uh, so we can uh, st state in that usually a half of village council. Uh, had a part of Jewish members uh, is is a reason to ask who voted for these people and what motive was especially if, especially when we talk that in you in in village uh, Porohi there were uh, there were two two thousand 200, 200 Ukrainians and two hundred of Jews how uh, such amount of Jews can get a membership in uh, in local uh, in local council, so uh, stating any questions to uh, to such interesting facts helps us to to see a new pers a new dimension of coexistence, and and to make another level of historical uh, uh, reconstruction of real life dur during interwar. Uh, during Austrian and Polish periods in villages of Subcarpathian Sub region. Uh, thank you. I think you have raised some new perspectives, and it's just one more reason why you should defend quickly and share the re written results with everybody. Uh, we have uh, a coffee break in five minutes, but we don't want to miss the opportunity. If there are any questions that we can, what we can take, we'll take. And if not, maybe after the coffee break or later in the day, we'll have a time and be able to proceed. But are there questions, comments now? Yes. Hi. So, um, my question is, is no political party in the Jewish side, in my opinion, try to, to, uh, to propagate and justify cultures in this area? I mean, I understand in the 19th century, it was not really, it is really, uh, yeah, you have to but I just read a young women's book about how in the war time, really much more local activism, not just like the big things, and also not just about Palestine, about the Jewish states, and about life here and now in Eastern and Central Europe. So no Jewish party, and uh, Yiddish, Zionist, either try to use it? Ask a little bit. Why don't you answer now, rather than... Now? Yeah. Uh, it's an interesting uh, uh, question, and 
I tried, but there were a lot of political parties trying to involve local uh, local people to their as their supporters. So, uh, usually, this uh, you can trace it in political uh, reports of uh, poli uh, police police reports. Yeah. We can we can read a lot of. Uh, a lot of uh, trying to find a new support is among, among rural Jews. Uh, but the point is that you cannot trace the, how the, the idea were implemented in, uh, in society. Because they can came to the village, promised a lot of, uh, a lot of good ideas, but none of this idea, the political party had basically zero Mechanism how to implement this idea in real life. Uh, in a real world, like, contrary what? to urban. What? Contrary to urban, like they, you say, they didn't understand rural problem. Like, they even, it's not like they even don't know how to implement it. They don't have legally, uh, legally a mechanism how to, to open the school, for example. They. Uh, for uh, for Jewish society, for Jewish minority, the idea to open the private school was only possible when you involved in kahal, and then uh, like, due to kahal you can open private initiative, mm -hmm. private school, uh, and none of a variety of political parties have access to kahal, and when you don't have access to kahal, you cannot. Uh, you cannot uh, do nothing on practical level of politics. And this is, was a very key moment because uh, every, everything they can do is promises, like a very good and great ideas, and never this, and very seldom this idea were implemented in real life. Uh, according to the, uh, to the reports, uh, we can find some schools uh, of for example, in Snyat and Koyat. It was, it was very local uh, initiatives, but not very, uh, not very, something very broad. And uh, that's why I try to, I try to divide uh, that the political party were not very um, successive on the level of how to get to the villagers. And uh, they never get uh, get a great support among them because when we even try try to see the statistic in parliamentary election, not only uh, general Zionists get the biggest support, even the the majority of uh, of votes of, of, of in in villages. I'm going to have to announce the break. There's another conference on the other side of this wall, and we're trying to have, as I understand, we're having the breaks at the same time so that the food services will not have to set up twice. So, so you should have let us out five minutes early. <laughs> I should, but I didn't. You should have off. <laughs> but uh, we, uh, we will take the break now, and... Uh, we can talk, uh, as in the villages of the Carpathian region, not everything formal works, but informal activity is also valuable. So I am delighted to welcome you to our fifth session. We are progressing. Ah, wait, wait. Okay, I can do it. No, no. I was, okay, so we are progressing very nicely. Our fifth session is Jews between the Habsburg Monarchy, Russian Empire, and Polish Republic. And uh, our first speaker is Margarita Lerman. Margarita Lerman is a PhD candidate in the Department of Jewish History and Contemporary Jewry at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, a fellow at the Avraham Harman Institute of Contemporary Jewry at the Hebrew University, and uh, an affiliated researcher at the Leibniz Institute for Jewish History and Culture, Simon Dubnov in Leipzig, Germany, since 2024. 
uh, in her PhD project, she focuses on Jewish networks active outside the normative uh, confines of, of uh, uh, the law in the 19th century in Central and Eastern Europe, as well as their respective countries of immigration. Our next speaker is Natalia Polukin Ivanusa. Uh, Dr. Natalia Polukin Ivanusa is a researcher fellow at the University of Passau, Germany, at the chair uh, at the chair of Modern and Contemporary History of East Europe, Europe and its Cultures. She comes originally from Ukraine, which uh, where she graduated from the Ukrainian Catholic University in Lviv. She got her PhD in Eastern European History from the University of uh, Gießen, Germany. Currently, uh, she is working on a postdoctoral post research project about trans-regional networks of Jews of the Russian Empire, the Habsburg Monarchy, the USA, and Palestine in the 19th century. And her talk will be uh, interconnectedness between the Habsburg monarchy and the Russian Empire and the broad in Odessa in the first half of the 19th century. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, so today I want to illustrate the interconnectedness uh, of two empires, in particular the Habsburg monarchy and the Russian Empire, uh, by taking a closer look uh, to two cities, Odessa in the Russian Empire and Broda in the Habsburg monarchy. My focus today is going to be on the economical and also cultural scales um, of this interconnectedness. Just a short remark, uh, my talk today is an introduction to my postdoctoral project about Jewish networks between Habsburg monarchy, Russian Empire, the USA and Palestine in the long 19th century. And in my project, the big one, uh, I analyze on different scales, not cultural, not only cultural and economical one, uh, transnational Jewish networks of three cities, uh, which is Odessa, Brode, and Berdyce. So today I'm going to talk, um, this is my uh, short agenda, at first a couple of words about Brode, its historical background, Brode's Jews uh, and Haskalah, then about Odessa as well, and then I move to economical uh, scale, the, uh, to cultural scale, and then um, economical scale. I will talk about cultural transfer and transit, Brode Odessa. So I start with Brode. Brode was seen by many um, its contemporaries in 18th, century, uh, 18th, 19th century as a vivid economy, and also as a Galicia's cultural center. Uh, firstly, mentioned first mentioned in uh, 11th century, it was uh, it had it had a long uh, tradition, long history, and belonged for a long time to Poland. Uh, it was situated on the state border with Russia. Here we we see um, Habsburg Empire and the place of product. Um, sorry. Um, the trading volume of Brode um, on the eve of 19th century was quite impressive. Brode was the second biggest city in Galicia, with a population of 10,000 people, um, but its trading volume was eight times bigger than the one of Lemberg, uh, which was the biggest city with 30,000 inhabitants. And it constituted a half of the trading volume of Galicia, uh, of the Brode, I mean. Um, so, in course of the first partition of Poland, the, the city came under the Habsburger rule. Um, aware of the importance of this city um, of restricted goods exchange uh, for broader, Austrian government made a series of special arrangements for the city. Thus, a special transit tax was uh, introduced, Russian goods became tax-free, uh, and broader obtained a status of free city. Uh, this encouraged especially trade with Russian Empire. Russian merchants uh, imported tax manufactured goods from Germany and Austria in exchange of uh, raw materials. Further developments of trade with Russia took place during the Napoleonic Wars. That's, um, yeah. Now I come to the Jews, um, Jews of broader. Jews dominated from the end of 18th century uh, in the city's commerce 
and constitute um, 89 percent of Rhodes population. In uh, 1784, 91% uh, of all wholesalers from Rhode were Jewish, and they controlled 75% of total assets of Rhode. Um, so the economic influence is uh, obvious, uh, but cultural importance of Rhode is as well really important. Um, Boris Kutzmane described in his, in his fundamental work um, on broader the role of Galicia, um, of Galician city uh, as an intercultural springboard to Eastern Europe. The reason for, for that is the strength of Haskala ideas in broader. The origins of these ideas um, uh, come from trade links, um, from trade links um, of broader to Germany, especially contacts with the fairs in Leipzig, um, Frankfurt an der Oder, and then, uh, Breslau, now Wroclaw. Uh, eventually, together with Tarnopol uh, and Lemberg, Brode developed a special version of Haskala. It, it included, um, among other features, following. Uh, like no secularization as in Germany uh, was typical for this Haskala. Masculine in Galicia cooperated with orthodox um, orthodox educational institution, rabbinical uh, community leadership. Um, no special temple uh, for enlightened community was established. Like in Rode, there were two traditional synagogues um, which remained uh, the spiritual center of the community in Rode. Special for Brode was also the German link, uh, the um, German-friendly Haskala. Um, it was, yeah. So far to Brode, the introduction, and now I come to Odessa. Um, Odessa was founded in 1794 um, in a new established, scarcely populated uh, Russian province, New Russia. You, you can see the, uh, the border of this province um, and Odessa is over there. Um, so uh, many steps toward development of the city were made shortly after the foundation. Like commercial port was established, experienced merchants were invited, many inducements as freedom of taxes and military services for 10 years were introduced. State loans and freedom of religion were other examples. Um, a Russian uh, secret advisor, Apollon uh, Skalkovsky, observed dynamic atmosphere in Odessa in the beginning of 19th century. Uh, the quote, merchants were its particular, fi uh, its pragmatic figures, and they would often skip meals, avoid friends, disregard the feelings of the family, dine in the meanest taverns, and spend evenings in casino, where business was conducted in order to correspond uh, in order that correspondence not to be delayed, or a shipment of grain missed, money making because uh, became a consuming, all important preoccupation, and every merchant, speculator, exporter, and entrepreneur, however small, felt that this his fortune could be made at any moment. This reflects the atmosphere um, of this um, really turbulent beginning of the 19th century. City uh, grew rapidly, and the value of its exports ro rose as well. Here you see the um, uh, this um, uh, growth um, in 1802. Uh, the total um, export value was one and a half million rubles, and um, 11 years later, it was already nine million rubles. Partially to, uh, this was the case, partially to the local policy, but partially also to Napoleonic wars and the growing global importance of Russian grain trade. Um, 1817, uh, the city obtained even the status of free port, uh, which was kept by Odessa till um, middle of um, 19th century, 1859. Uh, yes. Um, now we come to the Jewish community of Odessa. Um, despite of being part of Pale of Settlement, Odessa was an unusual town. It was open for settlement for all Jews, 
and was especially favorable uh, for prospective Jewish immigrants. The settlement of Galician Jews to Odessa developed within two first decades of the 19th century. Um, thanks to their commercial expertise, far-reaching context, language, knowledge, and cult cultural orientation, broadest Jews uh, fit well into a competitive environment of Odessa. Soon after they settled in the port city, uh, they dominated the grain trade. Uh, as middlemen developed a number of businesses and first of all um, enabled trans-imperial uh, goods flow between Brode and Odessa. Let me present some statistics that illustrate the success of Jewish mer merchants in Odessa. Um, in 1850s, uh, Jews were the fastest growing commercial group uh, in Odessa. Out of uh, five and a half thousand individuals engaged in uh, trade in Odessa, in, 18, um, in 1851, 53% uh, were Jews. Um, Galician Jews, particularly from broader, constitute the wealthiest group of this community. Now we come to cultural transfer between those two cities, Brode and Odessa. British Jewish uh, migrants, especially the upper class, um, built some kind of diasporic community in Odessa, built on German language, the common tongue, uh, their common tongue, their enlightened cultural alignment, um, alignment and uh, common professional uh, skills. The leverage to influence Odessa's Jewish community was established as in the uh, late 1820s, uh, Galician Jews uh, took over the control over Odessa's Kahila, Kaha, uh, Kahila yes, and supervision of institutions uh, under its jurisdiction. Once Galician Jews built a sizable part of Odessa's Jewish community, and gained an important role in communal life, they established in 1826 uh, an elementary school, which combined Jewish scholarship and secular education. Uh, Jews from Brode established in 1841 um, their reformed synagogue uh, with the choir. Um, in uh, 63, they even even purchased an old piece of land and built a first choral synagogue in the Russian Empire, uh, which was a sign of um, connection with German um, uh, Haskala. Interestingly, the decision um, the decision of uh, Odessa's Jewish community to build a temple, um, not a synagogue in traditional style, uh, which was the case for broadest community is an example of how transferred ideas were evolved and adapted to the local Odessa circumstances. In case of Odessa, there, were, there was no orthodox tradition uh, when ideas of Jewish enlightenment came to the Black Sea, so that the incorporation of orthodox uh, tra tradition into the conception of Haskalah didn't take place here. As uh, J. L. Finkel wrote um, in 1844, Quote, in an effort to adapt their social position to this uh, new economic standing, some Jews a decade before, uh, a decade ago, before the Galician immigration, abandoned certain ritual practices and tried to make themselves appear less distant and foreign to non-Jews. Um, so the uh, Odessa synagogue you see here, and this is the broadest one which is more um, orthodox looking, if you have a closer look. So the institutions at the school and the synagogue um, established the structure which promoted modern ideas of Haskalah on the Black Sea coast. One further factor of the successful cultural transfer was Odessa's community receptivity, weakness of traditional Jewish life, Exposure, exposure to newest cultural institutions and trends. Also, the main uh, Jewish occupation in the first half of the century, the trade, influenced Jewish acculturation and cultural orientation as well. Involved in commercial dealings with Western partner, partners, the Jews of Odessa were inclined to learn other languages than Yiddish, 
Some merchants from Odessa who traveled to the Lake Tech trade, uh, trade Fair had a chance to take part uh, in reformed Jewish practices and may open themselves to these modern tendencies. Also, the children of Jewish tradesmen uh, studied secular sciences due to the need to prepare themselves for the, for the father, future commercial activity. To ask quoting Steven Zipperstein, whereas elsewhere Haskalah frankly, uh, frequently came to be seen as an irrelevant, impractical Western import um, promoting quixotic dreams and affecting the lives of only a few, Reforms here grew out of widespread social concerns and needs. Um, now, I would like to uh, continue my talk with the transit, broader Odessa, so the economical scale. This route, broad, uh, transit route, broader Odessa, was established in the beginning of the 19th century. A couple of Russian decrees boosted this commercial route. Um, for example, 1804, um, all transit goods were obliged to no taxes in Odessa uh, and could stay in Odessa's port warehouses tax-free uh, up to 18 months. Uh, following this decree, 300 merchants from broader established main deposits in Odessa and many moved completely to the Black Sea. 1808 uh, was another decree. Uh, Odessa obtained a wide set of infrastructure for merchants. Um, foreigners started to increasingly settle in Odessa, uh, so that soon afterwards many European countries decided to set consulates here in Odessa. The Black Sea port developed in a short time an extensive network of trade partners, which reached up to Caucasus and Persia in the east. Westwards, Odessa was connected with Austri Austria, Prussia, and Moldova. The transit uh, between Leipzig through Brode uh, to Odessa was the most successful. The role played by Brode's merchants was much than just providing their far-reaching network of contacts. The editor of Kamerchiskaya Gazeta, a commercial net newspaper, Grigory Nebulsin, uh, wrote in the middle of 30s, 1830s, that it were uh, Brode's Jews who helped tradesmen from Armenia and Belize to get loans for purchasing goods in the Leipzig trade fair. A further niche, uh, niche of Brodis Jews was logistic. This strong involvement of Brodis uh, Jewish merchants in the trade with Odessa enabled them, according to a uh, couple statistical calculation, to earn in the first decade of 19th century striking two million rubles. Um, this commercial artery, uh, Odessa Brody, flourished even more during continental system uh, caused by Napoleonic wars, as a contrabando activity dominated the economic transactions on Austrian-Russian uh, border. Starting from 1806, English uh, products, including colonial goods as tea, coffee, and sugar, were not to be officially sent to Europe. Since Russia at first didn't join this system, uh, colonial goods, goods could uh, still be imported. Further, they were transported unofficially to Europe. One of the main routes of this contrabanda traffic was uh, Odessa Brode. Uh, from Brode, these goods went to Duchy of Warsaw, or alternative to Prague, uh, and then to Saxony and to Confederation um, uh, of the Rhine, and eventually even to France. Uh, as Russia joined the continent, continental system in 1807, English goods still were imported to Odessa, however, by smuggling. According to daily reports uh, to Napoleon, uh, French administration was aware of this contrabanda conducted by broadest tradesmen. Despite the illegality and outrage of other tradesmen, uh, tradesmen who were bound to stick to the restrictions uh, of the continental system, broader smugglers were seen as a necessity and were not to be restricted harshly. Let me name at least two reasons for that. Firstly, Jews of broader were the most prominent uh, buyers of lion silk and other French luxury manufactured goods. 
Plus, in order to attract broadest tradesmen uh, to the annual Leipzig trade fair, they were allowed to bring additionally to the permitted Russian goods, also smuggled colonial goods. Secondly, the um, smuggling on the route Odessa border secured the supply of Europe with cotton. Uh, since the smuggling on the um, in the colonial system, it could neither be important from English colonies directly or from the Ottoman Empire by Mediterranean uh, Sea due to English control over French harbors. The fact that Russia, um, um, uh, Russian le legislation um, made an exception uh, for cotton trade, uh, no tax was invite, uh, in, uh, introduced created a favorable conditions for development of commercial connections between Rode and Odessa since the beginning of 19th century. Um, also in 1821, uh, Transcaucasia was granted custom preferences. The transit from Leipzig over Porto and Odessa uh, to Constantinople was expanded even farther. Now it connected Europe through Radukale, um, no, I think it's um, sorry uh, from Radu Calais in Georgia with Persia. So I marked this route uh, by myself. It should have looked like this. There were even a direct commercial route, which is this probably, by land from Rode to Tbilisi. Um, this was the shortest in terms of time and most effective, cost-effective cost commercial connection between Europe and Persia until 1830. The decline of trade with Brode Odessa was caused by uh, increasing uh, protectionist Russia, Russian customs policy. Uh, the free trade uh, was restricted first in 1823 and finally in 1859. So my conclusions uh, are following Jews from Galicia, especially from Rode, specialized uh, on long distance trade, earned fortunes through commercial cooperation with Odessa. In the beginning, just established uh, establishing branch uh, offices in the port uh, city, broadest Jews increasingly moved to Odessa within the first two decades of 19th century. The important factors for this decision was on the one hand, um, on the one hand, um, the declining importance of Rode for transnational trend for, uh, starting from 1830s uh, and emerging, on the other hand, emerging attractive opportunities for merchants in Odessa. Hand in hand with this economic transfer uh, went cultural transfer. The broadest uh, broader Odessa transit and settlement of broadest Jews in Odessa led uh, to a transfer of a Galician version of Haskalah to the Russian Empire. The transferred ideas um, were evolved and adapted to the specific Odessa circumstances, uh, such as profound materialistic culture and existence of direct contacts uh, between German masculine and actors from Odessa. Thus, uh, cultural alignment between Brodes Haskalah and Odessa's Jewish culture created a new self-establishing culture, culture across uh, Austrian Russian borders. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for a wonderful lecture. Now, Thank you. Uh, we move to our last uh, uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Dror Seger. Uh, is an historian who, uh, who received a PhD from Tel Aviv University. He is the administrative director of the Institute for the History of Polish Jewry and Israel Poland uh, Relations and the editorial secretary of the periodical Gal Ed on the history and culture of Polish Jewry, uh, both at the Goldstein Goren Diaspora Research Center at Tel Aviv University. He specializes in the history of Tsarist Russian, Russian Jewry in the 19th century and his book dealing with the social history of Russian Polish Jewry based on the Hebrew press of the period is scheduled to be published by Magnus Press by the end of 2024. 
and <laughs> hopefully yes. And uh, his lecture today will be uh, on the topic of uh, a possibility of an island, Jewish-Ukrainian cultural uh, syncretism outside the pale and uh, at, at the end of the 19th century. Thank you very much. Uh, since I'm among uh, friends and colleagues, I must excuse myself and also uh, protest a bit that I was uh, pressed into this into this, into doing this uh, lecture, not unlike a cantonist by my uh, dear friends and uh, organizers, and hence I gave this this title before I had an idea of what exactly I'm going to write. So I would like to make a small amendment. This is not uh, outside the pale, but rather on the edge of the pale, which could be either or both, in or out, and uh, I will explain uh, later why. A short conference paper can only display a very superficial portrayal of things, and here I think there's much to sink one's teeth into if we aim at the broader picture. It is generally accepted that the Jews in the late imperial area gravitated towards the dominant European cultures, the Russian and the Polish, less so towards the cultures of the imperial minorities, like Ukrainians and Lithuanians, for example. Furthermore, much of the literature dealing with Jewish assimilation focuses on the big towns and educational institutions, uh, and it would suffice to mention Benjamin Nathan's Beyond the Pale on the Ukraine, in the Ukrainian context, Nathan Mayer's Kiev, a Jewish metropolis. It is rare to find in the Hebrew press of the period portrayals of Jewish-Ukrainian assimilation, and especially in the out-of-the-way places, and such a description is what my paper here is about. The term syncretism I allude to in the title of my paper, this one I got right, wishes to denote the cultural choices and mixed identities made by the Jews described in the paper, making a selective adaptation of different cultural elements uh, from their Christian neighbors. In August 1896, there appeared an article in Hamelitz, a Hebrew newspaper published in St. Petersburg since 1871, and before that in Odessa since 1860, the article titled from the, age of the pa- from the Edge of the Pale. It was published in six installments, once a month on average, starting in August 1896 and ending in January 1897. The author of the article signed it under the uh, pseudonym Chov Chet Vav Bet, and to date this, he remains unknown. Hamelitz was at the time the central stage of public debate for Russian Jewry, a leading influencer of public Jewish opinion, and it was to the great extent responsible for creating the journalist, journalistic and literary public sphere for its Hebrew reading public. Other than that, Hamelitz cultivated since the 1860s a specific journalistic genre of essays that could be termed ethnographical travel reports, in which a writer, usually a male Jew, traveling around Russia, far away from his hometown and natural habitat, describes the Jewish congregation he met on his travels, compares it to his own town and congregation, and allows himself to point out the less than favorable attributes of his objects of inspection. The composer of this article here resided in and wrote from a town with a strange name of Machtav. It was a very common practice in the Hebrew press of the period to jumble the letters of one's name or or town of origin. In many cases, as in this one, it doesn't require much effort to rearrange the letters so they would make sense, suggesting the town's name to be Bakhmut. Uh, Pardon? What's the town's name? Bakhmut. Bakhmut, which is very much C- central uh, central attention in the last year. Thank you. This whole uh, th- this whole uh, essay of his concentrates, therefore, on the Jews of Elizabeth uh, uh, Ekaterinoslav or Novorossiya, parts of Novorossiya at the time. Um, so this is this is where he writes from. 
the town's identification as Bachmut is further enhanced by clues the writer provided later in his essay, in which, in which he mentioned the salt mines that were discovered there, quote, 20 years before, unquote, placing the date at 1876, which is, which is exactly right. According to his testimony, he was a resident of Bachmut for two years, making him a newcomer to town and thus an eligible observer from the outside. Otherwise, the frequent comparisons he made between Bachmut Jews and the Litva congregation of the northwestern parts of the Pale offer an undisguised hint to the writer's place of origin. One last introductory note, <clears throat> the newly imposed Tsarist restrictions during the mid-1890s effectively tore the Don region out of the Pale of Settlement and annexed it, quote-unquote, back into Russia by deactivating the so-called May laws that were constitu constituted back in 1882. This rendered living in the villages and towns of the Don region illegal for Jews, thus placing Bakhmut indeed on the, age, on the edge of the Pale, as its author termed it. These newly imposed restrictions required those Jews who wished to come to town from the Polish or Lithuanian parts of the Pale to travel over 600 years through the gubernias of Kursk and Kharkiv, that's 640 kilometers. As you can see, um, if, he's, if he's here in Ekaterinoslav and he wants to travel from the northern or western districts of the Pale into Bakhmut, he has to go around like this because of the newly formed uh, borders for Jews. This in turn transformed Bakhmut Jewish congregation into a frontier, frontier co uh, community of sorts that, as you shall see, resided not only on the edge of the pale, but also on the edge of Jewish civilization. Inside town, the writer informs us, quote, a Jew is free to roam all day and all night why scantily dressed and bare arsed, chasuf shet, while pecking in garbage heaps, surfing, searching for a piece of bread for his starving children, unquote. Outside the city walls, most of the area belonged to the newly annexed Don region that was out of bounds for Jewish settlement. Beyond this, resided, uh, beyond this restricted space lay Kharkiv, Gubernia, meaning they are inside the pale, legally inside the pale, but all around them, is an area which is, was just placed outside, outside the pale. The Jewish congregation, says the writer, included some 800 families, which according to the 1897 census, the number of Jews in town was 3,259 out of around 19,300 of the total population, making the Jews a mere 16% of the inhabitants. This was not your typical Jewish shtetl in the pale, where Jews consisted around 50% of the population or more. The writer knows the history of the town as a former Turkish village before it was colonized by Russia a hundred years before. Indeed, most of the town's inhabitants are Russians of the Pravoslav faith, he reports, and they build their houses in the style prevalent in internal Russia, one-story houses with generously built vestibules where the owners can often be seen sitting and sipping tea from samovars as Russians do. The history of the Jewish congregation, on the other hand, is not so clear to the writer, and he informs that nothing was recorded of its early days, and no pinkasim remained to tell the story. But the prevailing notion is, as it, it was heard from previous generation, is that the first Jews to arrive were demobbed soldiers from Nikolai's, Nikolai I's army, who chose to settle within the Pale, though they had the right to live in Russia. They made their living in the used clothes trade or traded in scrap metal, as both were businesses that did not require much capital to get started. Later came Jews from Mogilev and Chernihiv, who worked as servants for other Jews who traveled to the seasonal trade fairs in Poltava and Kharkiv, and were either fired or escaped from their employees after they were caught red-handed in some form of theft or embezzlement. The last group of the founding fathers of the local Jewish congregation were convicts from whom Bakhmut served as a location for enforced exile and penal colony, and some of them stayed after they completed their sentence. The characteristic tradition that those founding fathers bequeathed to future generation Bakhmutians, claims the writer, is the ability to drink in outstanding quantities Quote, 
not Crimean or Caucasus wine, but simple vodka at 90 proof or more. When a Litvak Jew comes to the home of a, such a Bakhmutian, he is astounded by the fact that a Jewish soul can pour a Jordan of such bitter waters into himself, and there's no doubt that if those Jews were pious and bathed themselves in the mikveh every day, they would not bathe in clear water, but in hard liquor." Unquote. The next wave of Jews who settled in Bakhmut were Litvaks, who were part of the Tsarist attempt to form agricultural colonies in the Katerinoslav Gubernia during the 1840s and 50s. But after this project failed to the greater extent, the Jews who did not have some sufficient means to get back home to Lite wandered into the neighboring towns in search of livelihood, and some found their way to Bakhmut. These Lithuanian Jews, inform us, informs us the writer, brought the spirit of Judaism for the first time to Bakhmut, and though they were unlearned people, they still had the smell of Judaism in them, so they led an observant life. Quite unlike the founding fathers who were, quote, complete ignoramuses, boorish simpletons who became total, total clods, unquote, later the third generation Bakhmutians were a mixture of both the founding fathers of the crude kind and the God-fearing Litvaks who came after them. The discovery of the salt mines in Bakhmut, quote, where Lot's wife was probably buried after she was turned into a pillar of salt, unquote, brought Jews from all over the pale into town, as other nations from all over the world, and in the last five years, meaning since 1891, uh, informs the writer, there was a new influx of Jews fleeing all sorts of calamities who settled in Bakhmut, the majority of belonged to the Litvak persuasion with the good and bad qualities that they inhibited. But indigenous Bakhmut Jewry those who were born and bred in town and their forefathers were buried in it, that third generation mentioned before are the heart of the matter, and this is where we turn into the ethnographical analysis of this whole article. The indigenous Bakhmut Jew, claims the writer, is a class into its own. He does not fit with any definition or inclination that is known within Russian Jewry. Ethnically, he is neither Russian nor Pole, the Sarabian or any other form of southerner that was known before. Politically, he doesn't belong or even identify with any of the known sections within Jewish society. He's neither a Haredi, an Orthodox, a Reformer, a Maskil, or an enlightened Jew, a Naor. He's not a nationalist or, or emigration, emigrationalist. Indeed, he seems both ignorant and indifferent to all attributes of Hebrew or Jewish culture, high or low. Consider this Bakhmutian, says the writer, a family man of a young age, a husband and a father. His shoulders are wide. His facial expression testify, testifies that he likes the good life. He's of an impressive posture, and he speaks fluent Choholian as a native southerner. In other words, he's like an Ukrainian. In one of his articles, the article claims that Bakhmutians even speak Russian with a Ukrainian accent. I continue the quote. From his features, one cannot imagine that he originates from the seed of Abraham, as he also lacks a Jewish nose. When he entertains himself in the company of the town's non-Jewish citizens, he often ridicules Jews, Jews, and especially Lithuanian Jews, in a language borrowed from the vocabulary of Russian Europhobes. Yet he himself isn't familiar with Russian literature. Later, the writer will dedicate a whole article to describe what he sees in a, as an uncommon pathological hatred of, ba of uh, Bakhmut's Jews toward, towards Litvaks. Despite him being brazenly unlearned and not well read, this native Bakhmutian Jew is very articulate when he keeps company, and especially in the company of women, and even most alarmingly, married women. In this context, the, writers go, the writer goes so far as to accuse this representative of the native Bakhmutian Jew that he bewails the fact that his father had him circumcised. To sum up, the writer terms this vodka-guzzling savage of a Jew who ab abandoned all traditional modesty and surrendered himself to the most base, carnal existence by the lowest terminology he could probably think of. A gypsy, he called him. The indigenous Bakhmut Jews were Jewish 
gypsies. In a more sober and less inflamed manner, the writer portrays the Bakhmutian relations to Jewish religious practice. They tend to visit the synagogue only three times a year, once on Yom Kippur and the other two to commemorate the Yolt site of their parents. The Bakhmutians do not compel themselves to observe the Jewish holidays nor the Shabbat, and they live their lives by, a general orthodox, by the general Orthodox calendar. Likewise, they do not observe the kosher laws, and he claims that some of the Bakhmutians don't have the decency to send one of their servants to the market to buy pork, but they go to the market themselves to do it. Oddly enough, at the same time, by some unresolved contradiction, the Bakhmutians do practice congregation, con, congregational politics, and they marvel at the conflicts surrounding nominating rabbis, cantors, kosher butchers, and the likes. In other words, they're interested in the practicalities of running a Jewish congregation, but they're not interested in practice, practicing Jewish religion. Finally, the author of the article, being a Litvak, is deeply concerned about the education of the Bakhmutian children grow, who grow up surrounded by Ukrainian nannies and servants, where Yiddish is not spoken at home, and a Hebrew letter is nowhere to be seen. What should we understand, what can we understand of all this? The unknown author's portrayal of the native Jews of Bakhmut, with all its unhidden biases, actually fit perfectly with reports from Hamelitz's quintessential uh, anthropologist of the Jews of Novorossiya, Elchanan Leib Levinsky, a Hebrew author, publicist, educator, and ardent Zionist. In the early 90s, he was a grain merchant who traveled widely around Russia, and he published his travel reports. He was among the first to signal, signal out the newly emerging, emerging Jewish bourgeoisie of Novorossiya as aristocrats who adopted a form of religious syncretism a cocktail of different beliefs, Jewish and Christian at the same time, quote, neither meat nor fish, unquote, were religious decrees mixed with superstitions, quote, those who do not believe in the Jewish God, but come nighttime they fear ghosts and ghouls, or those who put up a Christmas tree in their home, yet before Yom Kippur they go to the visited tzaddik, unquote. Another anthropological rule of thumb, according to Levinsky and others, the more bourgeois the Jews become, the more they assimilate the Christian society to surrounding them. And if these Jews do not invest in proper education, their children will lose touch with their Jewishness altogether. Levinsky wrote in the same vein about the Jewish congregations uh, he saw in the Volga area, as for a time he was a resident of a small village in Tavria, Gubernia, where, Jew where Jews came under the influence of other minorities in the Russian Empire, like Volksdeutsch. And he too was familiar with towns resembling Bakhmut, who bloomed all of a sudden when the economy got a sudden boost. Whatever other ethnic groups were drawn to such places and settled there permanently, Armenians, Greeks, or Tatars, Jews were the first to assimilate into, into the predominant Christian culture, even in out-of-the-way places like Bakhmut. The unknown Litvak author of the essay, essay titled On the Edge of the Pale indicates, in a rather rare example of journalism, that assimilation, assimilation happened in a selective ma manner, also into Ukrainian culture. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Now we have some time for questions. I'm sure there will, will be a lot of those. So please. Maybe uh, I have a question to Natalia. Uh, because it, probably it's my problem, I couldn't understand exactly how how the economical or trade decline of Prodi and the prosperity or growth of of Odessa contributed or uh, influenced the growth or the development of Haskalah. Mm -hmm. um, I would I would say not development but the spread and further development in uh, Russian Empire. The decline of Brody caused um, many of uh, local entrepreneurs in Brody to look for alternatives. Uh, so one of these alternatives was Russia. Uh, one of these alternatives was Odessa in Russian Empire. Um, by moving to Odessa, they brought, of course, uh, as I uh, showed in my talk, they brought uh, with them their alignment. 
like uh, the sculptural alignment of Haskala. They established the institutions uh, in Odessa. They also uh, communicated a lot uh, with, on a daily basis uh, with uh, local Jewish, um, uh, with local Jews of Odessa. So the ideas was spread like on daily basis, but also through institutions. Um, so they brought uh, something which was typical for Galician Haskalah mm -hmm. to Odessa, um, and then further it was um, developed in Odessa's environment um, because of its constant interaction with the local Jews, which were not all from Rodin. So, um, okay. is it, uh, does it uh, answer your question somehow? Yes, sure. Just uh, how come? How can I be sure it's not a coincidence? Oh, uh, it's not a coincidence. Um, you know, um, we know we know for sure that this movement happened because of different statistical uh, statistical sources. Also, because of newspapers. We talk about this, but of course, it's a story. It's a way of interpretation. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yes, yes Margarita, please. Yes. Well, thank you very much for your talk. I have a question to you. I, um, I think I hope I didn't miss it, but when you were talking about the struggle before it, I think you did refer to that as some kind of genre, right? Oh. Genre of some kind of a uh, you know, broader uh, phenomenon. A genre, yes. Okay. yes. Uh, so I was wondering if you if you if you know if this travel report you presented right now if it's kind of representative and the style it was written in or if you think it's exceptional. It it resembles it's within the genre. This is not a, a, a traveling Jew that goes around different communities. This is a Jew who came outside the community he lives in, and therefore he offers an outside uh, point of view on how it. Uh, uh, how, uh, how regular life uh, runs in it. It was something that was established by the newspaper uh, editors in the 1860s who were traveling themselves and they wrote a report about their, their impressions. So not a lot of movement, but still uh, the point of view is the same. Yes, Levy, please. Natalia, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you to all three of the uh, presenters. Very interesting. You mentioned about Brody that uh, the you spoke about the Haskalah in Brody, and I'm just wondering what about the fact that there was also the Cloys, the famous Cloys in Brody, and there was a lot of religious activity there as well. How did that play into uh, into the story that you you presented to us? Of course, I. Uh... Due to the short time, I uh, didn't include that in my uh, in my talk. But of course, um, on the uh, on the scholarly level, there were a lot of uh, connections to Russian Empire, not only to Odessa. Um, there was also uh, connections, for example, um, to Zheninets. There was a scholar who. Uh, who was born in Zemanets and then moved to Broder in order to uh, study there, and then moved back to Zemanets uh, and gave lectures um, on Talmud uh, in Zemanets. And we can see the influence of the Broder's Haskalah in, um, uh, in his conception, in his understanding of the uh, Haskalah. So uh, there were a lot of, um, also a lot of, uh, Interconnections on this level, um, uh, like um, individual scholars. Yes, for sure. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Other comments, questions? Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps for Rob, uh, this cultural syncretism uh, is perhaps connected with the previous question. It, it is uh, something. Uh, uh, extremely unique, or you can find uh, some uh, similarities, and, and why exactly in Bakhmut the syncretism uh, was possible? It's not, it's not unique, it's 
it uh, confirms with patterns we see elsewhere, uh, both in the Polish part of the pale and in the northern part of the pale, and it has to do with uh, the, the appearance of the beginning of a Jewish middle class. And the moment that you have a, the first generation who becomes middle class, they start detaching themselves from what people like this Litvak see as a traditional and, uh, and, uh, and uh, acceptable traditional way of Jewish life. They're losing their Jewishness, and then the second generation is already completely detached. They don't, they don't know the language, they haven't heard it at home, they don't speak Yiddish, they don't know Hebrew, they don't observe the holidays. It all happens very fast. Now, we had information about this, we have information about this uh, process, but it mainly comes from either big towns, Warsaw, for instance, uh, Kiev, for instance, but not from uh, out of the way places that are almost frontier, frontier societies. Why in Bakhmut? Bakhmut was pretty much nowhere until they found the salt mines. When the salt mines came, there was an economic boom and people started coming from all over. So you had this, you already had this nucleus from the beginning with very dodgy people. I mean, there were ex uh, Nikolai soldiers who, because they were, they were uh, uh, kidnapped when they were like as Catholics, they were pressed into the army when they were children. So they and they were sent far away from their hometown, so they forgot their Judaism. So from the start, they were a suspect lot. And then you had uh, runaway servants, and then you had convicts. That were far away from home. So the, the nucleus of the Bakhmut is just dodgy from the start. But the, already the, the third generation started from a somewhat detached uh, point, point uh, um, regarding his, his Judaism. And you hear, you hear the same class in the in, uh, May, uh, Mayer's book about the uh, Kievan Jews. They were interested in playing cards and going to the theater and they were speaking Russian at home. They weren't going to synagogue so much. And, the Hebrew intelligentsia was very much apprehensive that they're going to lose a big chunk of Jewish society. That's the, that, that, that's the, the subtext of this Litvak writer, like other Litvak writers who wrote about this process all over the world. Follow up a little bit to the, the basic difference between assimilation and syncretism. Because in assimilation, you have this uh, uh, tendency to live like others. And in uh, the syncretism, it's like uh, it's nostalgia for your own element. So it's my. Uh, syncretism is a random cocktail of things that you take from all over, yeah. uh, which uh, looks unnatural when put together. And it's a stage before total assimilation uh, okay, yeah. in this context. Yes. Uh, uh, all right. So I thank all the participants, and we deserved our lunch, I think. So <laughs> thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm pleased and honored to open the sixth session of this workshop. This session is about writing, fictional and documentary writing, and the uh, three presentations uh, will uh, introduce uh, uh, writing, uh, trilingual writing in Hebrew and Yiddish and in Polish, all related uh, to the Jews of uh, Eastern Europe. Our first, first speaker is uh, Professor <coughs> Shoshana Ronen, my dear friend and colleague. Uh, Shoshana, uh, Shoshana Ronen, uh, who for many years she was the head of the Hebrew department of uh, Warsaw University, and she made wonders there. I can testify uh, the, the, the uh, special na nature of this uh, department that uh, has become a vibrant center of teaching and research and uh, impressive international uh, conferences, um, really uh, ad admirable. Uh, her research uh, relates mostly to the Polish connection of Hebrew literature in different uh, contexts and uh, generations. 
I shall uh, mention just uh, a few of her uh, books, uh, Pauline, A Land of Forests and uh, Rivers, uh, and a monograph about uh, Joshua Ozia Stone, uh, Prophet of uh, Consolation on the Threshold of uh, Destruction, uh, the impressive volume she edited, uh, the trilingual literature of Polish Jews from different perspectives in memory of uh, Yud Lamed Peret, and this is just uh, uh, a portion of her uh, uh, activity and uh, uh, production. Uh, today she will discuss uh, a subject that I'm very cu curious about. Uh, uh, the, the title is uh, The Local Story of Jews and Ukrainian Villages as Told in Hebrew, Five Village Stories by Mikhail Yosef Gordachevsky. I have to disappoint you, Avner, because everything I know about Berdichevsky is from you. So for you, nothing will be new. <laughs> but in any way, uh, some background of Berdichevsky, perhaps all of you know, but he was born in 1865 in Medjibush, Ukraine. I am not sure how to pronounce it. And uh, grew up in the town of Dubova near Uman. And for studies, he went to Germany, first Breslau, now Wroclaw, then settled in Berlin, where he died in 1921. Uh, and I will discuss these five stories, which he had written over seven years, from 1992 uh, to 99. However, when he was editing his writing, he gathered them together in one section and gave them the title Village Stories, and this information is from you, Avner, so for sure it's right. Uh, the scenery of these short stories is nature. The, plot, uh, the plots take place in rural environment. The natural surroundings have great influence on the people who live there, Jews and Gentiles alike. In each story, Berdachevsky gives exact location all of which are small villages that before the partition of Poland were in the territory of uh, Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, then came under the regime of Imperial Russia, and today are mostly in the Ukraine. I would like to discuss the stories from the local perspective, in which the great politics on the one hand and ethnic and religious diversity on the other hand have marginal influence and relevance. In that respect, the scenery of the plots is trans-imperial. I, I, I hope I use it right. <laughs> Since political, I tried really to understand what is trans-imperial for weeks. <laughs> Since political borders and big politics as such are insignificant, and it sounds like paradise, right? In any way, the five <coughs> stories are in... Translating uh, translation in uh, English, the last bowl between the living and the dead, the summer and the winter, my offering, and in the valley. In two of the stories, the summer and the winter and my offering, there are no Jewish characters, and in the other three, there are Jews and Gentiles. The stories have a wide foundation of myths, uh, myths and legends, using Jewish and non-Jewish archetypes and models. However, the exact location of the plot, the rural way of life at the turn of the 19th and 20th century in Eastern Europe, and routine economics or familial problems emphasize the component of re realism, and it gives a concrete dimension, right? so the combination of realism and myth. Nevertheless, the demonic power of nature, human surrounding to, surrounding to, surrounding to instincts and desires, the figure of undead or living dead and the determinism of human fate, all these give the stories the dimension of myth and legend. Uh, Tsipora Kagan dedicated the whole book to the Gadic Midrashic foundation of Badichevsky modern fiction. Kagan argued that Badichevsky was looking for the polyphony that can be found in the Jewish sources. He revived those sources and interwined them modern firm, firms. Frames. His work was that of an artist, researcher, historian who cared for living Jewish individuals and not for questions regarding Judaism as such. 
Avner Holtzman summarized Berdachevsky's idea that Jews should, and I quote, keep their spiritual independence and grasp Judaism as an elastic and diversified national frame, and therefore alive and fresh, so each individual could find their own place in it. End of quote. This vision is very modern, postmodern, because it is pluralistic and opens the way to an individual expression within the entirety flexible frame. But the Chevsky tales demonstrates how tragic can be the fate of individual Jews who are trapped in uh, four cubits of halacha, or simply traditional customs. And it's not the same, tradition, culture, and religion, theology. In the stories, the last bowl and in the valley, the victims of the traditional merciless and inconsiderate con conducts are women. And I'm so sorry, I, don't, I won't have enough time to discuss with that part of the stories. And I would like to concentrate on two parts. One of the is the relations of uh, uh, Gentiles and Jews, would say to the Ukrainians and Jews. And the second one is nature and culture, and the struggle between nature and culture. So when it comes to um, Jewish-Ukrainian relations in peasant uh, Ukraine, in two stories, the last bow and the valley, there is only a single Jewish family in the whole village. Therefore, good neighborly relations with peasants are necessary for work and daily uh, forthcoming. In these stories, the, Jews head of, the Jewish head of the family holds the traditional Jewish profession. He's a leaseholder. In between the living in the dead, Yetzi, the Jewish protagonist, trends a mile in the village Zankova by the river Yatran in the Ukraine. In the last bowl, Old Shlomo rents a water mill in the small village Darya in today's Ukraine. And in the valley, Shmaryau Avigdor also rents a flour mill from a Greek Catholic landlord. Avigdor lives in a mansion house surrounded by seven smaller houses of peasants in the valley Nahalon, a quarter of a mile from the nearest village in today uh, Belarus. The Jews of the village are described as pious, whose faith is naive. They observe mitzvot, but they are not very learned, and they rarely open books for study. If they read some text, usually on Shabbat, it is either the weekly Torah portion, Haftarah for men, or Tzena Ena for women. Old Shlomo, in the last bowl, is a philanthropist. He gives charity to the needy, and they help people in distress, including the local non-Jewish peasants. His wife, Zelda, is also a kind and benevolent person who lives in a state of peace of mind and naive self-assurance that one corner in heaven is awaiting her and her husband. Actually, all the, what I'm, when I relate to the women uh, figures here, wives, they are not really necessary for the plot, but I can't abandon women at all, as it is done for centuries. So, but usually the wife are the background of the main protagonist, which is the man, of course. Um, Yetzi, uh, the Jewish protagonist of Between the Living and the Dead, is also a simple, pious Jew. He's lawful because one should obey the law, not because he has inner moral imperative. In contrast to Shlomo and Zelda, who are really good people by nature, Yet he is a decent man in his professional conduct because it is written in the books that this is the right way to behave. He gives uh, to charity because a Jew should do so, and he is loyal to the owner of the mill because it is his obligation. Yet he is the type of a person who is addicted to his work. He is immersed in it um, to the degree that uh, for 30 years he did not open a book even on Shabbat, so as not to be distressed on working days, as if books distress him, right? However, which is important because Berdichevsky, the book is, is something really, I would say, more than just a book. But maybe it will be time to talk about it afterwards. 
Uh, however, he prays a lot even during, uh, during work time. Shmaryahu Avigdor from In the Valley is a simple and pious Jew who at times recalls some verses from the Torah on the prayer book, but he is not a scholar. He is a good person and easy to be with who has an opportunity, uh, uh, appropriate relation with the peasants. His beautiful wife, Malkishua, this is also not by an accident, this uh, uh, name, is a restless character who does not feel comfortable in the village and does not like country life. All three men have proper and fair relationship with the local peasants and also with the local priests. For example, when Shlomo's daughter is in the lost ball gets married, the village priest sends his blessing, and the peasants participate in the wedding party. Also in the story in the valley, the local people take part in the wedding celebration. In this story, the village is portrayed as an idyllic and a harmonious place where each person has their own occupation and is happy with that. Also, Shmaryahu Avigdo, the only Jew in the small village, has his work uh, which he loves and he knows the peasants' language very well and the name of each and every one. The only difference is that he believes in another god. The stories portray good and at times benevolent contacts with no hostilities or conflicts. Yet, on the other hand, there is no description of profound and intimate friendship between Jews and Gentiles, let alone a love relationship or marriage, apropos you did. One story is exceptional in that respect, between the living and the dead, depicts a much more complicated relationship between Yetzi, the Jew, and two Ukrainians, the peasant Ivan Mateka and Vasil, the keeper of the old Jewish cemetery, and I will concentrate more on this one, on this story. The story describes Yetzi misconduct towards Ivan, so Yetzi must compensate Ivan and receive his forgiveness. Compensation and forgiveness occur after Yetzi's death. One freezing winter night, when Ivan is driving a horse-drawn carriage, he loses his way. Frozen and exhausted, he reaches the door of Yetzi's house. But even though Yetzi hears the knock on the door and realizes that someone needs help, he is too lazy to get up from his warm and comfortable bed and to open the door for the person in need. When he finally does so, he is too late, and the farmer's cart is already moving away. A year later, Yetzi dies, and when he reaches the heavenly court, it appears that he will not be sent to heaven since his offense against Ivan was too whitey. The verdict decrees that Yetzi should return to the world to serve Ivan as a servant until Ivan forgives him. Only then justice will be done. Kagan showed in what a way this short story corresponded with the ancient Jewish legend of the wandering dead. Two versions of that legend appeared in a, the collection of Jewish legends that Berdichevsky edited. In this story, Berdichevsky followed the legend that offered a way of, for tikkun or tshuva, uh, namely making up for, for the harm and repentance. But the Chevsky has a moral viewpoint that is not equivalent to the world of uh, view of the legends. But the Chevsky's morals are illustrated in the contrasting characters of Yetzi and the main protagonist in the story, Vassil and Vassil, the cemetery keeper. Yetzi, uh, which, who is Ukrainian, Tak Vassil. Yetzi has to go out of this grave to fulfill the heavenly verdict. On a freezing winter night, the grave opens and Yetzi comes out. The first person he meets is Vasil, the cemetery keeper, who lives by the cemetery. He knows that Vasil is a poor man, although he works hard. He has four children and a wife whom, as it is written, contrary to custom, he does not beat. But he does not, he does not particularly like her either. Thus, Vassil is not portrayed as a righteous of innocent per person, and this fact is highly important in Berdyshevsky's reflection of, on what makes a person moral. Unlike on a similar freezing night a year before, when Yetzi was reluctant to open his door to Ivan, 
In this case, Vasil instantly opens the door and asks Yetzi in. Yetzi, the walking dead, cannot enter because he has a mission of repentance to fulfill, but he asks Vasil to lend him his shoes, hat, and fur coat. Despite the fact that Vasil is a poor man who does not have many clothes, and we know that his wife and children also use his fur coat on cold nights, he does not hesitate and gives Yetzi all that he asks for. Two and a half years of Yetzi repentance are not easy for Vasil, as if when Yetzi has his clothes, he also has a part of Vasil's soul or psyche. The story implies that acting ethically, ethically is not always an easy deed. It has consequences, sometimes problematic for the moral persons, sometimes the benefactor has to suffer with the beneficiary. As has been mentioned before, the story has the structure of a legend with Tikkun at the end. So Yetzi atones for his sin and Vasil returns uh, to mental health. Kakan asserts that what makes the story vision different from the traditional Jewish legends is the idea that far-sighted excellence can be revealed in the life of each and every person, Jew or Gentile, and not only in the life of a Jewish tzaddik or spiritual leader. In that sense, Badechevsky's insight is universal and humanistic. Morality depends neither on faith and religious law nor on social status or education. But the Chelsea says the legal ethics of uh, Yeti against the natural morality of Vasil. It can be said that morality is not the consequence, consequences of written law and learning, but it is an, an undefined human instinct, perhaps. This entirely fits by the Chelsea criticism of Jews who stick to the book and the way of life remote from nature. So they, that they forget what nature is until they de- become completely alienated from it. But the Chesky, with the Jewish culture being so close to his heart, did not necessarily see, necessarily see that Jews were superior or better than Gentiles. The opposite may be true. The Jew, who is a normative person, works hard, does not break the law, and is a devout Jew, lacks morality, while the ethical type is the simple, not always normative Gentile. Morality or moral behavior, the story suggests, is not the result of contemplation, education, or wisdom, but of human impulse, a perception which echoes neo-romantic ideas. And just as We do not know who the 36 righteous are because they can appear in the world in diverse persons. So there are no external criteria according to which we can learn in advance who is moral and who is not. This story is an echo of Badechevsky criticism of Judaism that alienated itself from nature and created a way of life which contrasted. Therefore, Yetzi, who follows the Jewish law is immoral, while Vasil, who is in primordial spiritual type, is the ethical figure. And the second part, nature and human fate. In village stories, nature plays a significant role. It is a powerful aspect of human lives with which it is in constant struggle. As a result of the eternal struggle of nature and culture, Humans are victims of both. At times, nature is an ancient, demanding god that should be appeased by people's deeds. Like in the story, My Offering, in which a human sacrifice is demanded. Seasons have a dominant presence and play a crucial role in human life. But the Chelsea concentrate in these stories on the contrast between winter and summer, that in Eastern Europe are so significantly different. In between the living and the dead, winter, which is a major factor, um, I would like to make it shorter, in, in, in the plot is a difficult season. When spring approach, nature awakens, 
Uh, spring is the time when every bird, tree, and beast of the field renew their youth. Summer is the time when nature is fully revived and blooming. Summer is days of healing for all living. This is a quote. The village is a place that is far from civilization. It does not mean that there is no culture. People live there, after all. But that they are dif different people than those in towns. It seems that everything in the village is more intense, instinctive, primal, and distant from cultural patterns and harsh institu institutionalization tradition or institutionalized tradition. It is a place where the thin layer of the monotheistic religion can crack and Asian cults and beliefs tightly embrace the village people. Apropos neopaganism. Uh, in, in the valley, it is alleged that towns are a completely different world than village. And when one wants to travel from the village to the town, they need to take a long road and then to cross a thick forest, a primordial obstacle untouched by human hand. Quote, the trees stand closer together, their branches interwind. Man with his axe has not yet ventured there, unquote. It is like a challenging rite of passage between nature and culture that demands humans' effort before they arrive to a cultivated territory that is no more a sheer threatening terrain. The village is separated from civilization by a fear-provoking forest, a place where elves or angels or forest enjoy summer and in winter hide in caves. Village is a place which stands in the middle between the town and pure nature. And pure nature is a place of ancient mythological creatures of pre-Christian era. Nature has its own ways and the world keeps turning, season change, one generation goes, another comes. There is nothing new under the sun. Nature is indifferent to the fate of humankind and all beings. The profoundest case of a first battle between man and nature appears in the story My Offering. It is a tale in which primordial and mythical elements, forces of nature, nature and paganism are interwoven with the riddle of human psyche. This very short tale, only a page and a half, has two parts. The first fragment illustrates the village Tarova in Podolia. In contrast to villages in other stories, it is a desolated and poor place. The land and the people who live there do not enjoy the generosity of nature. The land yields only meager crops. The trees are thin, the people small, the houses like stables, the dogs hungry, and the night is particularly dark because no one lights a candle. This village has a better past, about had a better past 50 years before. Then a Polish nobleman ruled the place and he had a marvelous palace, but only ruins remained as a two stump of the past. We are not told why the glorious past turned into miserable present, but the narrator implies that it is the result of human deeds, perhaps a grave sin. Quote, the poverty that man brings is greater than that which comes from nature, unquote. Nevertheless, there is one magnificent power in the village. It is the river, a storming, raging river, which is like an ancient god a version of the mythical Poseidon who, when summer comes, demands an offering. It can be any living creature, human or non-human, and only after it has the city's sacrifice, it ceases to be dangerous to people and animals. No one knows why. It is a mystery that all the inhabitants of the village accept an unquestioned predestination. Interest, interesting. Although there are no Jewish elements in the story, the title is taken from Numbers 28.2, when gods of, God of Israel says to Moses, quote, command the children of Israel and say unto them, my offering and my bread for my sacrifice made by fire, 
For a sweet savour unto me shall ye observe to offer unto me and their due seasons. Unquote. But the Chesky implies that not only mythical gods in diverse culture demand offering, but the God of Israel as well. Therefore, the Jewish religion also has an ancient pagan foundation. For Bedechevsky, this was not necessarily negative because he wanted the Jews to regain their primal vitality that was lost in the diaspora when Jews became the people of the book and their religion focused on the law. Here, Jewish paganism echoes the paganism of Christian peasants. The second part of the, this story gives the account of Vasil Abramov, the horse keeper at the post office, a representative of a progress, a stranger that came to the village and is the absolute opposite of the villagers, superior to them in every respect. When summer comes and the river demands its offering, its offering, the peasants are terrified to get close to it as long as the river does not receive its sacrifice. Basil is irritated because he does not believe in superstitions, so he jumps into the river and has a tough struggle with the water. Basil is not defeated by the river and comes out of it alive. However, and here is the deceitful moment, Basil does not feel pleased with the, his triumph. On the contrary, he becomes distressed, perplexed, he loses his appetite, he is left he is left fragile and defenseless. The mythical victory turns into a modern story of psychological or spiritual hardships. Some, same, uh, some days later, Vasil jumps into the river again, and this time he does not come out. He chooses death, and the river receives its offering, and with this sacrifice, the primal order is restored. This story has various interpretations. Um, now I will comment some of them. Otion Bartana claims that the nature does not demand accidental sacrifice, but the best, the most complete, because human perfection is a challenge to nature. In a world dominated by forces stronger than men, human power and nobility can only be expressed in rebellion, which will ultimately fail. But Dichewski created a metaphysical, mythical story whose conclusions are tragically, uh, tragically de determinist, in contrast to the spirit of the Hebrew literature of the period. At the time, Hebrew literature was dominated what was what is called Malacha uh, Chadash, the new course or the new direction. Uh, yesterday, uh, Hishai Ginsburg called it new direction which is the Hebrew version of literary nat naturalism. Kagana says that it is a mythical story, and the second leap to the water symbolizes the unification of man and the cosmos. Basil, not God, chooses the sacrifice, chooses himself. He chooses fate not arbitrarily. He had inner mental powers that drew him to the river. It is not a coincidence that before drawing himself, he re recalled his mother, whom he had not seen for 10 years. The leap into the water is a return to the womb, to the starting point, to a new beginning. Therefore, in a pseudo-mythical story, there are no gods, no transcendence, no higher powers, only man and nature in their struggle and unification. This interpretation could not be accepted by Chaim Wiesel, who understands the story as the triumph of fate upon man. Yitzhak ben Mordechai agrees that it is a mythical story that turned into a modern one. What is interesting in his brilliant multi-layered multi essay is that although there are no Jewish elements in the story apart from the title, the author thinks that it is essential. The river is the border between the traditional way of life and the modern world of Maskil. Those who dared to cross the river became the model of the Talush, uprooted young Jew lost between those worlds. The Jew who left the traditional pious way of life was often considered dead by his family, which is a symbolic death, 
But there were cases when the, those young men felt so lost that they could not keep on living, and in such cases, the death was real. And reading all this interpretation, that all can be accepted, but also can be um, rejected as well. Uh, I think what is important is the reading of the critique or the reader than what actually Berdychevsky had in mind. And in case, just to sum up, I'm finishing. What is common to these stories that Berdychevsky edited together under the title Village Stories? And what is the, the common feature? The power of nature is enormous influence on human life and fate. It is also the realm in which people let themselves express emotions and desires which are sublimated in urban environment. However, nature is also dangerous because it releases people's emotional and social inhibitions, and the consequences are something tragic. Moreover, nature has the power of mythological and capricious gods who are also dangerous. Nonetheless, the bonds of culture no less dangerous because culture, namely customs, tradition, and in institutionalized religion tend to destroy beauty, innocence, and free spirits. So there is no way out. <laughs> Robbed between <laughs> nature and culture. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, stimulating presentation. If we have time at the end of the session, we shall uh, allow some uh, time for a discussion. But now we move uh, straight to the next uh, uh, speaker, Professor Stanislav Obirek. Uh, he's a uh, cultural anthropologist, a professor uh, in Warsaw University. He teaches in the American Studies Center. Uh, and he's uh, well known in Poland, in Poland uh, as a prominent uh, participant in Polish intellectual uh, discourse. Um, his work is, is, is a blend of uh, uh, history, religion, anthropology uh, in a very uh, original uh, combination. He has written too many books for me to mention here. I should just uh, note uh, a few names of his books from the last uh, decade um, of God and Man, uh, The World and uh, Ourselves, Paul Catholic, uh, Narrow Path, Why Did I Leave the Church, Gomorrah, and uh, Babylon, Criminal History of the Church. Uh, his uh, presentation today is also a very uh, intriguing uh, subject. Stanislav Lem and his Jewish secret, why Jewishness became a problem for Polish Jews after World War II. Uh, thank you, Abner, for the, your kind introduction. And thank you for organizers to invite me, particularly uh, Judith Kalik. It's also a pleasure to come back to Tel Aviv. And the subject of my paper uh, is actually surprising also for me, uh, the outcome. And I hope that I will uh, share this surprise wi with you. Uh, Stanislav Lem is known, uh, first of all, as a, as a science fiction writer. He was born uh, more than 100 years ago in Lviv, 2000. Uh, the 1921st, uh, passed away in Krakow, uh, 2006. Uh, he got uh, Jewish education. Uh, he had his uh, bar mitzvah even in 1934, probably. Uh, and uh, survived the war as uh, one of the few uh, Jews in Lviv with his family on the Aryan side. And uh, the purpose of uh, my paper will be to reflect on the possible reasons uh, for Stanislav Lem's uh, silence about his Jewish background. 
Um, this, this was not isolated in, in Poland. Uh, uh, the opposite is true. Uh, most of uh, Jewish writers uh, in Poland uh, had a problem with their uh, Jewish uh, identity. Uh, it will be a kind of case study for, um, as Evner mentioned, I'm cultural anthropologist, so for me it is a case of uh, uh, post-ethnic uh, Jew and post-ethnic Paul, perhaps. Uh, the topic was treated by Paul Hollinger, post-ethnic America, or <coughs> Magid, American post-Judaism. Um, of course, in both cases, it is not mentioned about Poland. Uh, uh, my uh, paper, uh, I will try to be uh, disciplined, and in four uh, steps uh, I will reflect on the uh, Jewish writer in the face of Catholic countries anti-Semitism, uh, uh, the second uh, part will be on allo-Semitism, xenologism coined by uh, another Galician Jew, Arthur Sandauer, and the third part, uh, Lem about himself. Mm, and the third, uh, the fourth, uh, very short uh, uh, part will be uh, uh, Lem as prophet of non religious um, sources of ethics and freedom. So, the first part Jewish writer in the face of Catholic countries, anti Semitism. In recent years, the question has been raised in the public space in Poland as to why writers of Jewish origin have been reluctant to write about their origins. There is even talk of shameful or fearful silence about this fact. This applies, for example, to the eminent poet Tadeusz Różewicz and precisely to Stanisław Lem. As for Lem as a Jewish writer, apart from his biographer Agnieszka Gajewska, who wrote uh, last year, published last year his uh, uh, very impressive biography, Wipenzony z Wysokiego Zamku, uh, no one has written about this fact. And yet, um, an extensive library could, could be compiled from books and articles devoted to both to the problems of Jewish writers and to Stanislav Lem himself. So why exactly in the case of his writings this topic was not raised? The answer, according to Agnieszka Gajewska, is simple. As she writes, what we are dealing with here in Lem's is Lem's, I quote, obliteration of the traces of his Jewish origin. The bi biographer explains this fact in two ways. On the one hand, she notes the desire to forget the horrors of the war and the will to start all over again. And on the other uh, hand, she notes the existence of widespread anti-Semitism in post-war Poland, which made the writers of Jewish origins uh, keep silent about their Jewish identity. And she writes, I quote, like many others, Lem decided not to return to the past and start a new life with a clean slate. Such a plan, however, could not succeed after what he experienced. Uh, end of quotation. Not only this explanation seems to be con convincing, but it applies not only to uh, writers of Jewish descendant creating in post-war Poland. For this was a global problem. But the Polish context contains elements worth noting as specific to this Catholic country. Implicit in this is the silence about the Holocaust, uh, for example, to give uh, an, uh, from different context, um, American historian Peter Novick also tackled this subject in his book, The Holocaust in American Life, trying to understand the reasons for the silence on the Holocaust. Novick explains the silence on the Holocaust of European Jews in the US in the first decades after the war by, on the one hand, the lack of interest of American public, and on the other hand, the reluctance of the survivors themselves 
and their families to talk about this crime. Katia Diener showed that the thesis of silence about the Holocaust was a myth, as the opposite can be stated in light of the surviving materials, as it seems also in the case of Stanislav Lem. It is difficult to talk about silence or cover up since already in 1948 the author submitted for publication the novel Hospital of Transfiguration and only intervention of the censors made the book appear only in 1955 along with two others among the death and return as the series entitled Time Not Lost. It's very Telling, I think. As Stanislav Lem confessed in an autobiographical sketch uh, written in uh, 1983 in German, by the way, uh, writing this uh, book was a way, I quote, to rid myself of the weight of my war memories, to expel them like pus. But perhaps I wrote this book also in order not to forget the one motive could be, well, go together with the other, end of quotation. Had it been possible, the subject of the Holocaust would have been become the main theme of his work in the first years after, the, after he and his family arrived to Krakow in 1945. Restrictions and of censorship meant that Lem could not publish books and concentrated himself on the problems of the history of science. By the way, thanks to cooperation with Mieczysław Hoynowski. And then began to publish novels in the style of science fiction. This was a completely accidental decision and had to do precisely with the need to bypass censorship, which, however, affected uh, all the right, uh, writers' work. In addition, the subject of the Holocaust was banned throughout Eastern Bloc. And from 1949, according to the guidelines of socialist realism, depressive subjects were to be avoided in general, while the superiority of the socialist system over the capitalist system had to be pointed out. Um, I'm just trying to skip some elements, so, but I, I, I think what is important, what um, Shulamit Volkov called the anti-Semitic cultural code, and I think this is uh, very um, important for uh, Polish uh, context, although uh, Volkov uh, limited her argument to imperial Germany, Nevertheless, her findings maintain their uh, value uh, in relation to Poland as well. Uh, and here I, I, I have a long discussion on, on Polish anti-Semitism discussed uh, by uh, Catholic writers, uh, chief editors of Tygodnik Powszechny, Jerzy Turowicz, uh, of Więź, Tadeusz Mazowiecki, they are very important figures, and then Jan Błoński is a literary critic, and uh, Stanisław Musiał is a, is a priest. And all this after the war debate is very important in the context of um, uh, Stanisław's uh, LEM uh, activities, because he was um, uh, took careful note of this discussion, uh, not only because he was friend of uh, uh, Turowicz, Błoński, but also he himself published in Tygodnik Powszechny after the war. So now my, my second point, um, allo Semitism and the attitude toward Jews. Here I would like to start with my uh, thanks, uh, to express my thanks to uh, Scott Uri and to Alex for uh, giving me this uh, English version of the book, which uh, is very important for my second part, because um, Arthur Sandauer, um, a writer and influential literary critic uh, born uh, not far from Lviv in Sambor, uh, in his book uh, on the situation of the Polish writer of Jewish descent in the 20. Uh, century devoted my uh, much attention precisely to the problem of anti-Semitism. 
In his opinion, however, it requires detailed clarification and consideration of Polish peculiarities. To this end, he proposed the intriguing neologism, allosemitism. He was classicist by training, so I think this Greek word allo, other, uh, was very apt to uh, express his main idea. Uh, with this new term, Sandauer shows that Jews were treated as others, which did not always mean a hostile attitude. As he writes, allosemitism, and I quote, consists in distinguishing uh, this uh, origin in the conviction of the uniqueness and provides a general basis from which both anti- and philosemitism, uh, philosemitic conclusions uh, can be drawn. However, in practice, in the history of post-war Poland, we mostly had to deal with anti-Semitism, shaped prim primarily by uh, the Catholic uh, Church. Uh, in his opinion, and I will quote from original. Uh, um, the attitude of the authorities towards the Jews was shaped by the powerful ideology of the church. The mixed attitudes towards the holy damned people inherited from the Catholic uh, church find expression even in his legislation. Such legislation bestowed on Jews a privilege granted to neither burghers nor peasants. This, that privilege was nobility granted to Jews who converted to Christianity. This act absolved them from the sin of their side. End of quotation. Thus, also in a historical perspective, it was Catholicism that shaped the attitude of Polish society toward Jews, which did not change, unfortunately, after, even after 1945. This is even more astonished because after the Holocaust, there were practically a few survivors left in Poland. Um, I will perhaps skip. Uh, next part. Uh, however, the essence of uh, Sandauer's book, um, with uh, its telling subtitle, uh, It is not I who should have written this study, is the problem of assimilation of Jews, uh, Jewish writers into the dominant Polish culture. The author has amassed an impressive body of evidence that justifies his thesis that, uh, I quote, assimilation failed, but poetry succeeded, as he wrote regarding the work of Julian Tuvim. Uh, towards uh, himself, as a Jewish writer also, uh, he is even more radical, saying that assimilation turned out to be impossible but the analysis of its impossibility turned out to be possible. Uh, and this makes this book uh, really unique. Um, and to conclude this problem of allosemitism, I would like to um, quote uh, Zygmunt Bauman, uh, who actually is treated by many as the author of this, uh, uh, allo uh, this concept of allosemitism. Because Bauman wrote in English, so and our in Polish, uh, so it explained a little bit that uh, Bauman's concept is more uh, known than this by uh, Sandauer. So according to Bauman, and this is di directly related to, to my understanding of uh, Lem. Um, so uh, according to Bauman, under postmodern conditions, where politics is wrapped increasingly around identity conflicts rather than around orthodox, national, class, or status contradictions, allosemitism is likely to lose the unique position it occupied in pre-modern times and throughout modern history. As it seems, this is how Stanislav Lem viewed his Jewish background. 
he did not attach much, much importance to it while he was surprised immensurably by what he called anti-Semitism without Jews. My third part, Lem, about himself. A good starting point in reconstructing uh, Stanislav Lem's autobiography can be a quote from the book published in 1968, his master's voice, Guaspana, rightly regarded as the most saturated with biographical threads. Even if it is risky to identify the narrator with the author, there are many indications that the main character, the famous mathematician, uh, Peter Hoggard has much in common with the author. This is even more likely because Stanislav Lem has repeatedly expressed skepticism about critics' reading of his work. Hoggard thus states, and this is quotation on the beginning of the book, with sufficient imagination, a man could write a whole series of versions of his life. It would form a union of sets in which the facts would be the only elements in common. People, even intelligent people, who are young and therefore inexperienced and naive, see only cynicism, cynicism in such a possibility. They are mistaken because the problem is not moral but cognitive. The number of metaphysical beliefs is no greater or less than the number of different beliefs a man may at, uh, entertain on the subject of himself. Sequentially, at various periods of his life, and occasionally even of the same. I think it's a very autobiographical. Um, I think that uh, the perspective and possibilities of different ways of telling his life fascinated Lem on the one hand, but also created an awareness of the partiality and in the inadequacy of what was written about him. This book also indicates a dramatic description of mass execution, which the narrator cites after an account from uh, Dr. Rappaport and another character of the, uh, uh, his master's voice. And this is obvious from uh, reconstruction of uh, his uh, biographer that it was uh, reminiscence of his uh, own experience in Lviv in 1942. Um, in any way, uh, the most important uh, uh, source of, of uh, uh, autobiography or awareness who, how he really perceived himself is, is the essay, as I mentioned, written in German and when he was in, in, in Berlin in, in 1983, uh, in German entitled uh, Mein Leben, but is known better as in, uh, from its uh, English version, published in the January issue of uh, The New Yorker, as a chance and order. And I will uh, quote some uh, aspects, some uh, fragments uh, from this um, autobiographical piece, because I think it illuminates uh, very much uh, Lem's uh, self-understanding as uh, what I called post-ethnic uh, uh, Jew. Um, how much time did I... <laughs> okay, so I will perhaps keep uh, some... Okay, so perhaps uh, this fragment, uh, which I think is very important, uh, about he, what he think about himself as a Jew. My ancestors were Jewish, but I had no idea about Judaism or, unfortunately, about the Jewish culture. In fact, it was only to Nazi legislation that I owed the realization that Jewish blood flowed in my veins. However, we managed to avoid imprisonment in the ghetto. Thanks to false documents, my parents and I managed to survive the time and um, of quotation. He does not omit uh, the most dramatic turns in his life, such as Hitler's invasion of Poland in September 93, uh, 1939, 
um, uh, two times occupation of the Beirut army during World War II. Uh, but he attributes, and I think this makes him this post-ethnic, uh, the greatest importance following the example of Albert Einstein to ideas. Uh, and I quote, uh, and I think this is the most uh, important um, quote from his self-understanding. In response to a request to write his autobiography, Einstein emphasized not the historical circumstances of his life, but rather his most beloved offspring, his theories, because they were the children of his mind. I am not Einstein, but in this respect, I nevertheless resemble him, for I am of the opinion that the most important parts of my biography are my intellectual struggles." End of quotation. It is impossible not to agree with him. In the last uh, part, I would just suggest the possible interpretation of of, Ever, of, of uh, Lem. A prophet of non-religious sources of ethics and freedom. In the autobiography, Lem made surprising confession. I'm a disshunted reformer of the world, end of quotation, adding a significant explanation. I am not yet a despairing reformer of the world. In this confession, Enough to um, is this confession enough to situate the work of the author of Solaris in the tradition of biblical prophets? Even if the thesis sounds paradoxical, Lem was a declared atheist. In my opinion, ethical sensitivity on the one hand and concern for pres preserving spiritual independence on the other justify the search for such genealogies. Um, however, the basic difference between the biblical prophets and the work of the author of his master voice is that Lem did not speak for God as the biblical prophets did, but in his own name. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, uh, now we move to the third and final presentation in this session uh, by uh, Dr. Vladislava Moskalets. Dr. Moskalets is an associate professor at Ukrainian Catholic University and researcher at the Center for Urban History, both in Lviv. Dr. Moskalets studies Jewish social history, focusing on the issues of elites, transition, intercultural relations, social mobility, in the 19th century Habsburg Galicia and Yiddish reportage literature. She is currently working <coughs> on a book examining the topic Jewish industrial elites in Drohobich and Bo Boislav, 1860 to 1900, and is conducting a research, a research project on the urban elites in, of Lviv in the second half of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. Her uh, lecture today is Traveling is in Yiddish, Rediscovery of Eastern Jews in Interwar Reportages from Poland and the Soviet Union. I'm very happy to be in the literary panel since I'm not a literary scholar, so I feel like I'm an impostor, uh, but I would be very happy to hear your, uh, your feedback. And uh, my paper will explore the travelogues to Poland and Soviet Union written in Yiddish in the interwar period. And the genre of travel reportage to Eastern Europe and especially to Soviet Union became extremely popular in the uh, 1920s, 1930s. And we have we know many uh, examples from, in different languages, from American, from European authors, including uh, British traveler Bernard Newman, who was uh, traveling uh, Poland on a bicycle, German Jewish authors Josef Roth and Alfred Doblin. Uh, however, the interwar period uh, also became a, par a moment when uh, Yiddish press developed uh, very fast and uh, became, became, received uh, prominence. And in my talk, I will focus on how the Jewish authors tried to comprehend the radical changes that happened to Jewish communities, to Jewish titles, 
uh, after World War One, and uh, I became interested how uh, those authors are with Eastern European background, how they were able to see the subtle divisions within the Eastern European Jewish communities and consider the question of Jewish belonging in, uh, in contrast to usual orientalizing of Jewish, uh, of Jewish life in Eastern Europe. And here is the list of the authors uh, and the text I was uh, working with. Uh, and I want to discuss these travelogues as, uh, within the framework of mental mapping. Uh, many previous scholars, we have previous works on uh, interwar Yiddish travelogues, uh, uh, which usually uh, by uh, Yuri Vidyapin, uh, François Agunet, uh, Kenneth Moss, uh, which usually focused on uh, uh, the places like India or Palestine, and uh, presented, uh, presented these travelogues as ethnographic uh, descriptions. And I would like to look at this, uh, people who travel to these familiar places, uh, to Eastern Europe, uh, and uh, with a land with substantial Jewish populations, and uh, the land which also became a part of two new states, Second Polish Republic and uh, Soviet Union. And uh, I argue that travelogues became an important tool in the situation of stateless nation, because it showed this attempt to understand the borders, understand the question of belonging, uh, and uh, mm, usually we, uh, we also need to see, the, to look at them in this context of long, long tradition of orientalizing and sometimes self-orientalizing of Jewish population of Eastern Europe. Uh, many of us read this text that usually described some man traveling to a shtetl, describing this uh, sm oni uh, street that smells onion. And uh, I wanted to see how Yiddish authors do they do they see these uh, places uh, differently? And uh, so I have two destinations which uh, look differently, uh, but uh, and which also um, uh, attracted reporters because of different reasons. So first, uh, uh, but I will try also to look at some commonalities. So the first one is was Galicia, which was attracting people as a land of famous uh, uh, Hasidic tzaddikim, maskilim, brother zingers, and uh, this ha uh, this was had uh, this idea of um, a place of authentic and various Jewish culture. And um, these authors uh, could travel. So we have Joel Matko, Michael Joshua Zinger, Nachman Meisen, Chaim Choskes, who traveled to, uh, to, to Galicia. They traveled not from far places. They traveled usually from Warsaw. Uh, and uh, they tried to understand the place of Galicia in this map, because Galicia <coughs> became a part of the new Polish Republic, and they tried to understand how uh, life of Jews is corresponding uh, to, uh, to it. And um, uh, also, uh, they, instead of this opposition between Western and Eastern Jewry that we, use, uh, that we often, uh, often see in other texts, they show differences within Galicia, between Western Galicia and Eastern Galicia, within uh, this very small and uh, between uh, the, um, the former Pol uh, Kingdom of Poland and, and Galicia. And I will uh, uh, speak about it uh, later. And um, these uh, travelogues were usually advertised widely in the press before they were published. So they were published very fast. Um, the um, uh, post offices worked much faster than they do work now. And mm -hmm. usually we know that the author says, I will, pub I will write a new report in two days. And in two days, it appears in American newspaper, something incredible. Now it takes two months to get a letter from, from America. Uh, to Ukraine, so um, and they were advertised in, 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 uh, before, and uh, in case of famous authors like Abraham Kahan, who was an uh, uh, editor of uh, Forwards, they were advertised in Times Square or in matchboxes, so they <coughs> were a big deal. In case of uh, Galicia, I, I, and I was uh, trying to keep attention how they were advertised. So here we see the um, advertising of uh, future reportages of Israel Joshua Zinger. He was the brother of famous uh, uh, Nobel uh, Prize winner uh, Israel Bashev Zinger, uh, who was publishing under the pseudonym of Gary G. Cooper. And uh, so they, they write uh, about his upcoming uh, uh, reportages as Cooper has a good literary talent, and with this talent he described not the world of fantasy, uh, because we have many uh, fiction work uh, in Yiddish at that moment from Eastern Europe, uh, but they uh, emphasize that it is a piece of interesting reality of old-fashioned life in our old 
homeland. And they, so they are seeing Galicia as a part of their own uh, homeland, and he's writing for uh, for um, audience. Uh, in case of Soviet Union, uh, it attracted uh, observers of, from different reasons, uh, with this utopianism and sometimes exoticism, with this new project of integration of Jews into into uh, non-Jewish life. And uh, we have many uh, many people who are uh, who are visiting uh, Soviet Union. And the main themes that repeat, repeat in these travelogues are urbanization, industrialization, collectivization, and how they change this life of a shtetl, a shtetl Jews, destroying this uh, uh, small town artisan as a class, and creating a new Jewish uh, proletarian. And um, okay, so these are the, uh, the major newspapers I was uh, I was looking at. Uh, most of them were based in Warsaw. Uh, and uh, but they had correspondents in different countries, so they had a huge turnout, and they were uh, uh, extremely extremely popular. So, uh, for example, Warsaw newspaper Der Kind had correspondents in eight countries, including Palestine, Germany, and USA. And um, we have newspaper uh, Der Moment, uh, uh, we have uh, which was founded in 1910. Uh, and they, also the newspapers were centered for some uh, political movements. Uh, for example, their moment was uh, center media for Folkis movement, uh, and uh, also the main competitor of a uh, former newspaper, Der Heind. Uh, uh, the uh, newspaper, the Tragische Blätter, was uh, focusing on popularizing Yiddish literature to uh, to broader audience. And the largest and oldest newspaper was the Forwards. So, uh, for example, to tell you, in the uh, in, uh, in the 1930s, it had circulation 275,000 copies, so almost 300,000 uh, copies, and they were able to employ correspondents and send them to uh, distant countries like Soviet Union or uh, or Poland. And uh, this uh, reportages became this part of uh, generally developed Yiddish culture, so they were also part of the general discourse of uh, no, uh, fiction literature, uh, uh, Yiddish, uh, Yiddish songs, and uh, they also contributed to, uh, to developing uh, of uh, this culture. And many of these uh, so travelogues were published in the newspapers in the serialized version, so people were expecting to them uh, because they appeared from week to week. But later they were published in a book, and uh, one, uh, two of the books I will come back uh, the Yoel Mosboy published this book Galicia in 1929, and Israel Joshua Zinger published the book Naya Ruslan, Naya Ruslan Builder Funarizer about his travel to Soviet Union. Okay. Um, and uh, travelogues are every literature, every narrative is subjective, uh, but the uh, subjectivity of travelogues it presents this contrast with supposedly attentive eye, because the travel to very remote places, but they bring in something with themselves. So they usually depict their own biases, superstitions, expectations. And one of the most uh, striking feature of Jewish travelogues is this focus on Jewish themes and locations, uh, because they present to us something which is looked like Jewish Jewish land. They travel uh, to, to different uh, places, and I will give you uh, in a few minutes uh, examples. Uh, and a uh, Jewish travel writing researcher, uh, Leah Garrett, uh, she uh, emphasized this tendency to create their own Jewish, uh, Jewish geography. And uh, the inter-ethnic relations, they occupy a relatively small part in the, uh, in the travelogue, uh, but though we have some examples. Mostly they are focusing on uh, uh, locations like uh, Hasidic courts, uh, cemeteries, or organized Jewish uh, life. Uh, uh, but uh, it also uh, the changes that I, I was uh, referring to, the changes of the war, industrialization, border changes, uh, attracted uh, reporters to uh, different locations such as rural Jews, uh, Jewish uh, workers, Jewish factories, or Jewish collective farms in uh, Soviet uh, Union. So they are creating a new, a new Jewish, uh, uh, Jewish spaces. Uh, so uh, here, for example, I, I try to uh, collect the most uh, scenes that uh, uh, appear more uh, repeatedly. So in, uh, in geography of Galicia, was, uh, uh, almost everyone visited uh, big cities like uh, Lviv or Ternopil, Krakow. Uh, they uh, were visiting Hasidic courts, Belt and Chortky. So this advertising of, uh, I showed you a few minutes ago, was dedicated to advertising to visit of Israel uh, Joshua Zinger to Hasidic uh, Bells Hasidic uh, uh, Hasidic court in Bells, 
most of the Trotsky, they visited organ they tried to understand the organiza Jewish organization, how Jewish life was organized. So they usually came to small towns and met uh, people who were in the charge of uh, uh, who were in the charge of uh, organization, synagogue, uh, kahal, uh, or youth organizations that became very important because people who wrote to this uh, newspaper, like Der Moment or Literary Letters, they were very much involved in, uh, in the Yiddish, Yiddish activity. Uh, they were also interested in Jewish proletarians. We don't have many proletarians in Galicia, but since uh, but they managed to find them, and they uh, usually visited uh, Boroslav and Drohobych, uh, two or three of the reporters I, I, I checked they visited uh, uh, Jewish oil workers. Uh, Krosno in Western Galicia, the uh, Lysiki uh, or a Talish factory in Kolomea. And they also try to present this an, an obvious Jewish geography that I mentioned before. So uh, uh, Joel Matboim, she uh, uh, visited Carpathians uh, to see uh, Jews who live on the land and they are uh, performing agriculture, the theme that appeared today a few, few times. Uh, Convertites uh, from, from Lviv, or even Francis from Gliniane. So he is coming to Gliniane, uh, Joel Matboim, in 1920s, and he doesn't know if Francis exists, but he tries to find them and he makes these investigations and he describes his impressions in very vivid and interesting, uh, and interesting form. Uh, Soviet Union has uh, other particularity, of course, so uh, the things that are unique to these places are big industrial centers like Kharkiv, which you can see on the picture here, uh, Kiev, uh, Moscow, uh, Yekaterinoslav, uh, former shtetls uh, that I will be discussing mostly more, more today, like Bertichiv, and attempt to see how the shtetl changes because of industrialization. And uh, of course, Jewish collective farms and colonies that became very, very impressive. And of course, we need to understand that, um, that uh, uh, very often, Traveling in the Soviet Union was much more difficult than traveling in Galicia because you need uh, all kinds of uh, permissions uh, or you were shown all kinds of show up uh, uh, model factories or, 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 or schools or organizations that did not uh, reflect uh, the, the, the idea. And, uh, however, the authors I was, uh, I was uh, reading, uh, uh, Abraham Kahan and Israel Joshua Zinger were uh, critical of, uh, were much critical of Soviet, uh, Soviet Union, so they tried to uh, avoid this, uh, um, this uh, sh 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 showing up. And uh, as I said, so in this Jewish geography, we rarely uh, see other groups, non-Jews. Non, non, non uh, uh, however, we have a nice uh, essay of uh, reporter Chaim Shoskes, uh, who was fascinated by listening to Ukrainian songs in Ternopil area. So he sits uh, in the evening near some village in near Ternopil, and he listens to uh, Ukrainian women sing. So it's very typical motif, that, uh, uh, orientalizing motif that appears since the uh, 19th century. And they remind him Mirhorod, Poltava, and Nizhen, and he understands that uh, Ukrainians are part of the bigger nation. Uh, but uh, so he is fascinated by this singing, but at the si same time he feels guilty because he says, "How can we? Uh, how can we? Uh, he ca uh, how can? Why do we forget about Khmelnytsky and would like non-stop hear musical sounds of Ukrainian uh, fields?" And uh, later I want to uh, now I want to uh, explore different uh, tools by which these authors try to locate this land and try to make them uh, uh, more understandable to the audience. So uh, they either in Poland or in the USA. Uh, so first of all, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the authors who visit Galicia usually describe, compare, or contrast it with the Kingdom of Poland, and they notice the difference between the attitude towards the Jews and the much more loyal atmosphere in Galicia. So here we have example of Israel Joshua Zinger, Cooper, uh, who travels from uh, uh, Warsaw to Krakow by train in 1924, and he compares the atmosphere on the train. And he said that, that the border is, mm, there is no border, he has no official border between uh, countries, because the, it's now one country, Polish Second Republic. Uh, however, he says the border remains, I mean the line between anti-Semitism and humanity. So the line between anti-Semitism and humanity, if you are wondering, is somewhere in between Warsaw and Krakow. And uh, after the border, he says, begins a different world and a different age. Uh, the passengers who enter, uh, it does not matter if they are going or Jews, are friendlier, speak with a smile. They do not look in your face to see what race you belong to. If you have a high or crooked nose, 
if you are blonde or dark hair, and the atmosphere become, becomes uh, home-like. And, um, uh, and this uh, border change and this difference between, uh, between uh, Galicia and f former Galicia and former Kingdom of Poland continue and makes him later when he uh, travels to Lviv, uh, Lemberg, and he goes to the cabaret. And he's so fascinated by the cabaret, by nightclub, that he dedicated one of the essays to the, to, the, to the cabaret, which is not a Jewish place, which is one of these uh, uh, moments when they pay attention not to the Jewish places. So he describes the atmosphere, how house-naked women together with men walk through the room accompanied by the sound of bad music. Uh, in the middle of a room, a few flames were burning, like in an Indian temple, a lamp through light on different colors. And waiters were taking seats, as you can imagine, in hell. Uh, because the club was called Pikelko, uh, Little Hell. And uh, he said, we spoke Yiddish, because he's coming with, Yiddish, uh, with Jewish friends, we spoke Yiddish loudly, but it did not disturb anyone. Then we began to sing, but it did not shock the goyim. Even more, they begin to sing with us. And he is absolutely shocked that you have this friendly atmosphere in, in Galicia. Uh, and he said, me as a Warsaw, and all, both uh, Israel Joshua Zinger and Mark Boim uh, use this uh, self-identification as a Warsaw person, as a Warsaw. Me as a Warsaw could not even imagine such a behavior in Warsaw. Not only in the nightclub, but even in a Goyish cafe, people would show the door to such chutzpediki Jews. I don't know how to, dis how to translate chutzpediki to, uh, to English, but I hope in this room everyone understands. Uh, Jews come to the cafe where officers dance, and they don't not only sing and speak in Yiddish, but also make a scandal. And they, he is completely shocked about this. Uh, the difference, and we have very similar, or uh, even even more uh, subtle differences uh, in the uh, works on mass point. However, not only this this, uh, uh, com this comparison is not only in, uh, not always in the favor of Galicia. I will speak about it later. Uh, the other thing that they use is uh, this language adaptation. So uh, they are writing uh, people who write for forward are writing for American audience uh, that knows. Yiddish and English, but doesn't know any other language. So Abraham Kahan uh, tried to make a comparison with the United States. So when he visits Odessa, he described this saying that the Rybasovskaya Street was Odessa Fifth Avenue and Broadway, and the title of the of the of the uh, of the newspaper said about Fifth Avenue. Uh, they uh, described some words like Duma uh, Parliament in English, uh, saying City Hall, and uh, also. They are bringing this personal perspective, which is also one of the tools to attract the reader, uh, because uh, both of the uh, many of these authors, it's not their first time uh, and uh, in the in these areas. Uh, so they remind uh, uh, Israel Joshua Zinger trips to Kiev reminds him uh, of his earlier visits as a correspondent during the civil war. So he uh, contrasts what he saw violence and he saw before with the, with a much more friendly atmosphere. Abraham Kahan recalls his experience of emigration from Kiev in the 1880s. And they are returning to the same places, so they are now not only the reporters, not only the guides, but also the locals who are showing this, almost the locals who are showing this uh, place. Uh, important uh, thing that is influences this travelogue is the World War I and the revolution, and mm, that's why this Jewish experience is perceived as a spoiled and damaged. So first of all, uh, Galicia in the 1920s seems to be spoiled for observers because of the German acculturation and this German, uh, 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 it's too Germanized, though we know that Galicia was uh, uh, mostly at that moment the culturation uh, drifted toward Polish option, but uh, for, uh, for uh, those observers, the German was an orientation toward Vienna was uh, very, uh, very problematic. Uh, the second thing that uh, devastation after the World War II. So, for example, they go to Chortku, where the big Hasidic court was, but all the Hasidim fled to Vienna. The rabbi, a rabbi fled to Vienna, and there is nothing to see in the uh, in the uh, in these uh, places. Uh, all the transformed borderlands means that trading, all trading routes uh, are ruined. Uh, trading routes uh, that used to, uh, people used to send wine, lumber, or cattle, and now it's all, uh, all disappeared. So we have very uh, two similar uh, uh, examples. One is from a bro a broader uh, in regards to our previous, uh, previous session, uh, which is um, where Mothman describes a border town that have the status of free trade towns are under the curse, they are facing the worst of times, 
When I was in Broda, I met, without exaggeration, several hundred families who had become victims of the chain's borders. They used to have no shortage of Russian gold and smuggled forth, uh, could be seen in taverns uh, and under their beds. Now they are the poorest among the poor, so he goes into Broda in attempt to see Broderzinger, in attempt to see Haskala or, or, or remnants of Haskala, and he's nothing. He sees this uh, poorest of the poor. Uh, poor. Uh, the, you know, Israel Joshua Zinger, this time, he, so he, he was traveling both to Galicia and both to Soviet Union, that's why I'm mentioning him so often, uh, was uh, coming to Berdychev. And uh, he is uh, observing how Berdychev changed because of the net and because of the, uh, of the, this, the devastation of small, small, small town economy. So he said, he said about the restriction, and he said the Jews face more restrictions than non-Jews. All generation is still dragging on. One still trades with the peasants. Another receives money from America. The third lives thanks to his children. And the fourth is starving. Young people neither know how to trade nor want to. Despite the net, the seller and the merchant belong to the lower class, people without rights and important creatures. And who among young people wants to belong to the lower class? So he observes how this Berdychev is changing, how also Odessa is changing. And uh, Odessa uh, is, uh, is, is uh, not the same anymore uh, because it knew Odessa lacks cosmopolitanism and people are surprised by every, uh, people are uh, now uh, surprised by every foreigner, but they used not, used not to be, sur uh, used to be not sur so surprised before because they were used to this cosmopolitan, uh, cosmopolitan atmosphere. And the last thing I want to focus on is this uh, idea that this uh, self-representation of this author as a missionary of Yiddishism, uh, especially in, the, uh, uh, in Galicia. So uh, Galicia was, uh, as I said before, was very much criticized, uh, first of all, of, uh, uh, because of the assimilation uh, or German acculturation, secondly, because of lack of initiativeness. As we know, the uh, capital, uh, Galicia used to be, uh, uh, Lviv used to be a capital of, of Galicia, of the province. In the interwar period, the capital of new state in Warsaw, everything important uh, goes to Warsaw. Yiddish life in Galicia is present, but it's not anything prominent comparing to the Warsaw. And um, Ian Matboin traveling there criticizes this Galicia. He says, uh, here is an old Galicia with a small but pale Jewish intelligentsia with German crawling manners. Intelligentsia is lazy and backward. The text from yesterday is strange from today. Uh, but he has a hope, uh, however, is the youth, which is feverishly trying to emerge from a dark assimilationist fog and is thinking with all its might about Jewish cultural life. But most, of, uh, most importantly, he thinks about himself, that he's coming from former Kingdom of Poland, and he's bringing this energy and bringing uh, uh, this knowledge how to organize uh, stuff how to organize Jewish life to, to Galicia. And uh, so uh, he, uh, he, uh, mm, he has this, uh, this hope to, uh, to Galicia. Uh, the, second, uh, the second motive uh, where it appears is in the text letter from Galicia uh, written by Leibus Reikurs, uh, who was originally from Lviv but later moved to, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to, to Poland. Uh, so uh, he also said, uh, was agreeing that yes, Galicia is lazy, Galicia is uh, too, too late, and we need to cooperate with the rest of the Poland to become like, to, uh, to, to become, uh, like, uh, like them. And, um, mm -hmm. So uh, this criticism of Galicia and this uh, criticism of Galicianers comes not from the imminent, uh, some imminent features of the Galicianers, but of this influence, bad influence as they see it of Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, when we see uh, the Yiddish life in, uh, in Soviet Union, it looks uh, very interesting because it's organized by state. So the state tries, uh, it's a period when the travelers come, and the most of the travelers are, uh, uh, are published in 1920s, 1924, 1928. In 1930s, there are much less, uh, much less of them. So the, uh, Israel Joshua Dinger goes to Yekaterinoslav, uh, now knows it, uh, later Dnipropetrovsk, now Dnipro. Uh, and, uh, he observes the, how the uh, state tries to uh, impose the. Um, uh, I'm, I'm already finishing. I hope we will have. Uh, we will have. I will be on time. So he uh, criticizes. He, criticize, uh, he, he observes the failed colonization, failed attempt to uh, Jewish organization to bring uh, people to Yiddish schools. So uh, I, 
in Soviet Union you have this organization, but it's still not helpful because of the uh, because of the um, uh, assimilation and because of the diff uh, other reasons. So he goes to a Jewish teacher and he says, so uh, Jews are supposed to send children to Jewish schools, but they say Russian schools. We need only Russian. And then the committee that is supposed to decide which school the children will go, ask the children what their native language is, the parents tell them Russian, say Russian. And they don't sell them to Russian schools, they can study either in Ukrainian or Jewish schools. Uh, only Russians can get can get to the Russian school, but because but it gives you better opportunities in your career later. So it very often happens that when Jews are asked what language they speak with their children, they answer Ukrainian. Uh, though it is clear that neither they nor their children understand the word of Ukrainian. So we have this, sim this uh, similar grievances over the uh, lack of Yiddish in the Soviet Union, but there is no idea of any missionary activities by, uh, by, uh, by the Jews. So to conclude, uh, these travel reportages reveal complex relations to old home, the mixed nostalgic attitude to these places associated with, with Hasidim, and uh, the, this desire to observe the changes which happen to the Jews in new context and to make and to make those changes. And uh, <clears throat> and the journalists, on the one hand, they strive to show the continuity of these old borders, but also the divisions that resist to the changes of uh, formal uh, borders. And uh, they have common goals. They want to show these Yiddish reading audiences this different dimension of diaspora to show how, how different Jewish life can look like, and the still these places, uh, the diasporic places are still uh, uh, still Jewish, and uh, still uh, they still have uh, have some uh, relation to them. And they are feel this also, or they feel like ethnographers in some ways. So we, we still have this ethnography moment, even if they come into their old places, because they are recording this last moment of existence of this old world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our time is up. Uh, but uh, if there is an urgent question to one of the speakers, I shall allow it. If not, the discussion will continue during the coffee break, and the seventh session will start at 5 o'clock. We have a slight change in the order of our presentations. We will begin with Rav Rafael Kreuzer, who is also a PhD student in the School of Jewish Studies and Archaeology in Tel Aviv University, and works on the supervision of Mos Gara. Which sit here on the next floor. His research focuses on Jewish perceptions of the urban space in European cities in the early modern period, as portrayed in the rabbinic literature. The floor is yours. And now I'm leaving the camera as it is. Right. Good afternoon. It is an, as a, an honor for me to speak in such an important forum. My research deals with Jewish urbanism in a Lachic literature, and I want to talk about the phenomenon of the development of municipal supervision of Slader in Eastern Europe. According to Jewish religious law, there are special kosher laws on food especially when it comes to the way animals are slaughtered. In order for meat to be kosher according to Allah, the animal must be slaughtered according to the rules of Jewish law, and in addition, after slaughtering, the animal must be checked for trefa, which is pre-existing mortal injuries or physical defects. According to the Torah, one who has studied the laws of slaughtering properly and has trained his hands to slaughter, is kosher for slaughter and even throughout to declare whether the slaughtered animal is kosher according to Allah. The rolling on the animal that is not kosher has significant financial consequences for the owner of the animal who then has to sell the meat only to non-Jewish customers, therefore the slaughterer has a heavy responsibility. 
already in the Talmud we learn about the duty of the slaughterer to show the knife to the rabbi in the city. And in modern times, an official certification was developed. After the, relation process, after the learning process, the slaughterer was tested by a rabbi and received a license to be employed as a slaughterer. Can there be a difference between the kashrut requirements in the city and the kashrut requirements in the village? Is there a different difference between observant Jews in the city and those in the village? Apparently, the answer is that until the 19th century, there was no substantial difference in matters of kashrut between the Jews of the city and those of the village. But in the 19th century, the difference between them became more significant and the tension between the halachic authorities in the city and the Jews of the village increased. The industrial revolution of the 19th century and the accelerated urbanization processes also caused significant change in the meat industry, in consumption habits and in the delivery methods of the meat. Urban slaughterhouse replaced the local butchers and the village became a major import supplier of the urban meat for the meat industry. Along with this, processes of supervision and policing in the urban meat industry began. Both out of a growing awareness of sanitary needs and disease prevention and as part of the rise in power of the central government. The researcher Anna Maznik wrote in her doctoral work and in the article she published about the change in aging patterns and supervision of the meat industry in Moscow in the second half of the 19th century. In this lecture, I will not discuss change in the meat industry. My focus in this lecture relates to the change in the kosher supervision laws in the 19th century. At the beginning of the 19th century, rabbis amended a new regulation that spread rapidly throughout the cities of Eastern Europe, according to which a slaughterer should not slaughter alone, about, but in each city two slaughterers should be appointed, and both of them should be present during the slaughter so that always one would slaughter and the other would supervise him. Rabbi Moshe Sofer, known as the Khatam Sofer, Rabbi of Presburg in Hungary, which is today Bratislava in Slovakia, described at the beginning of the 19th century that there are differences in this regulation between different communities. While in Frankfurt is Rabbi, Rabbi Pinchas Uvitz stated that all acts of slaughterers would be in the presence of two slaughterers. In Preshburg, in custom of having two slaughterers present during the slaughter is only for slaughtering of cattle, but not poultry, poultry when one slaughterer is sufficient. This rule gradually spread throughout the 19th century to many cities throughout Eastern Europe. Another stage in the development of slaughter supervision occurred during the mid 19th century. One of the famous polemics that divided the orthodox and rabbinical world was in Berdichev, in which the great rabbis of Eastern Europe were personally involved. The crux of the story was when an except slaughterer was appointed in Berdichev in 1832, appellants aroused against the slaughterer who claimed that he is not God-fearing and proof of, his, of this was that he gave kosher to mask of the animals he slaughtered and the percentage of defects he found were few. They also claimed that he was often drunk. This example was whispered and claims about the drunkness of the slaughterers 
so faced throughout this period. The polemic against the slaughterer went beyond the city limits. And in 1843, Rabbi Shlomo Kluger from Brody was invited to Berdichev by the city leaders to decide on the matter. Rabbi Kluger, one of the greatest rabbis in Galicia, stayed in Berdichev for about three weeks during which he visited the municipal slaughterhouse every day and followed what was happening there. After returning to Brody, he published his conclusion against the slaughterer from Berdichev and ordered his removal from office. Of course, his decision was not accepted by everyone, and letters from other rabbis were accepted in favor of the slaughterer and the co controversy continued. As a result of Rabbi Kluger's visit to the Berdichev slaughterhouse, he printed in 1848 in Lviv a book called The Slaughterer's Regulations, containing a list of regulations for the order of slaughter. These regulations were published again in several editions. The opening of the regulation in the later editions noted the following. Shlomo said, I was called to the great city of God, the only community of Berdichev to settle a breach in the matter of slaughter. And the Lord was with me and I established good regulations and customs for them. And already if the state of Russia at that time, several communities copied, copied these regulations. The first and the main innovation in these regulations was the appointment of an inspector, or in the words of Rabbi Kluger, a watcher, who is an additional person apart from the slaughterers who will not engage in the work of slaughtering, but will only supervise the work. Supervise the work. The watcher will receive his salary directly from the community found and not from the butchers so that he is not dependent on them. From now on, it was not enough that there were two slaughterers standing there during the slaughter, but a special inspector was a dead old job. It was to overlook the slaughter and check its kosherness. A new phase in the kosher institution can be identified here. This is where the position of a kosher supervisor was born, an individual who received a salary from the community found, the appointment of additional person who is not one of the slaughterers, and was professional rule was the reg regularly supervise the work, naturally caused the price of kosher meat to rise. A letter from the rabbi of Orozovo in the Minsk region of Belarus at the end of the 19th century notes that following the order to appoint two slaughterers, the price of meat rose from 25k to 45k for beef and from 1k to 2k for chicken meat. This change in the urban slaughter system raised the question of what happens with the slaughter in the village. Who supervises the slaughter in the village? If there is a religion in the city that there must be two slaughterers present during the slaughter and an inspector standing and watching the slaughter. Ours is carried out in the village. Do we have double standard in slaughtering laws, one for slaughtering in the city and another for the village? Of course, one can argue that the meat industry in the city in the large slaughterhouse did indeed require excessive supervision, as can be seen in the description we have from Rabbi Malkiel Tenenbaum, Rabbi of the city of Lomje, at the end of the 19th century, of the situation in the city of Arenburg. 
They slather hundreds of animals there, all in one cool room, and the slatherers and their servants work under pressure to rush rushing craft. The elaborate slatherhouse stood in contrast to the village where the slathering took place in frequently, privately, and a relaxed manner, so perhaps the village could be satisfied with one slatherer. However, the price difference between the slatherer in the city, where there is a kosher supervisor and the rural slatherer, caused increasing tension between the urban and the rural. The unsupervised slathering in the village was a threat to the urban slathering, and indeed the rabbis of the cities decreed that meat from the slathering of the village should not be brought into the city. As noted in the answer of Rabbi Yosef Shaul Nathanson, Rabbi of the city of Lviv in the second half of the 19th century, who wrote, we will make a rule that we don't eat meat slathered from outside Lviv. In other words, the rabbis of the city and the leaders of the congregation decreed that res residents of the city not bring slathered meat from the village into the city. However, this was not enough, and new regulations were made in the cities according to which village slatherers were pro prohibited from slathering. And in any case, those who want to slather in an animal in the village must wait for the city slatherer, working under the supervisor of the city's rabbi, to come to the village to slather. And as Reb Nathanson tells about himself, that he used to travel from Lviv every summer to the Dacha, sometimes to village of Triskovich near the city of Drovich, and sometimes to the village of Levin near the city of Orodok. And in this village, when they wanted to eat beef, they would wait for the town's slatherer to come and slather it for them. However, not everywhere the villagers accepted the municipal regulation that for, forbade them to slather independently. And as with the residents of the villagers near Yulanov, who refused to con accept the regulation of the rabbis in Yulanov, Yulanov not to slather animals in the village identically, identi in then independent, independently. We have double doc documentation of this debate, both from the answer of Rabbi Nahum Gezenbor, the rabbi of Livshov, who supported his son-in-law, who was the rabbi of Yulanov, and from the response of Rabbi Nathanson, the rabbi of Levi, to this issue. The main story is about a slatherer named Rabbi Buni, who came to live in one of the village, villages near Yulanov and slathered for the villagers. The butchers of the city of Yulanov complained to the rabbi of the city that in the contract made between them and the community it was written. With the mayors of the city, the heads of the community together with the rabbi here have committed to the butchers in the must beneficial way that the villagers who obey our discipline will not be slathered by any other slatherer but by them. And they claimed that so it used to be for the last 10 years then that there was no slatherer in the village. The slatherers from the city were going from time to time to the village to slather there, or the people of the village were sending, sending animals to be slathered in the city. In contrast, Rebunim, the slatherer, argued that the villagers cannot send their poultry to the city every time, and that there are serious halachic problems in the shipment of unsupervised meat by non-Jews. 
According to him, even when the slaughterers from the city come to the village, they are in hurry to leave and do not slaughter lazily. He presented a, a, a signed document by the villagers in which they wrote that they can't comply with this regulation. Rabbi Gassenbohr accented his answer in the book which ironically is called the ivory tower, to establish the authority of the townspeople over the villagers and claim that the townspeople have the power to amend regulation for any area of the city, even contrary of the opinion of the villagers. And the villagers are obligated, according to Allaha, to obey the regulation of the city. In addition, he claimed that it is impossible to eat from the slaughter of slaughterer who was not under the supervision of the supervision system of the rabbi of the city. Rabbi Nathanson agree with Rabbi Gessenbauer's conclusion and supported the power of the townspeople to amend regulations that bind the villagers as according to him it is a custom throughout the Jewish communities in Europe that its villagers belong to the city in all community matters. Along with the argument in the question of the authority of townspeople over the villagers, this answer reveals another significant argument against the kosherness of slaughtering by the villagers indicating the assimilation of the priority of the urban bureaucratic system. Max Weber and others spoke of the rise of the impersonal and professional bureaucratic apparatus during the 19th century. In the polemic about the slaughterers of the village, it can be seen that the rabbis of the cities adapt important elements of the bureaucratic apparatus as a more correct way of the relationships in the meat industry. In the rabbi's answer, the difference between the traditional relationship between the rural slaughterer and the owner of the animal and the relationship in the bureaucratic city between the slaughterers and the owners of the slaughterhouses is sharpened. sharpened. According to the rabbis, the municipal bureaucracy and the impartial relationship between the slaughterer and the butcher produce kosher meat at high level. The slaughterers in the city are employed by the community and they have a permanent position and receive their salary from the city's budget. On the other hand, in the village, the slaughterer does not receive a fixed salary, but receives payment from the animal owner who invites him to slaughter his animal. This difference means that in the village, the slaughterer has a greater motivation to is to uh, the kosher regulations and rules that the animals are kosher. The novelty here is that the total disqualification of the village slaughterers, or even a disqualification the natural situation that exists in the pre-modern world, when one did not suspect a slaughterer to declare the non-kosher meat as kosher. According to the rabbis, the modern city and the structure of supervision created in the city are not only a necessity caused by the large amount of meat slaughtered in the modern city, but are an ideal state of a bureaucratic system that prevents direct con contact between the slaughterer and the owner of the animal that enables higher level of kosherness. This claim helped to justify the super superiority of the urban kashrut system over the independent slaughter in the villages. In conclusion, we saw 
how at the beginning of the 19th century in Eastern Europe, a much more significant community supervision mechanism began to operate over the slaughtering process. Throughout the requirement of the participation of two permanent slaughterers, and later in the century, a special position of a kosher supervisor, supervisor was added to watch the slaughtering process. The third and interesting stage in this development, in, this, in, in the supremacy of the city over the villagers and the attempt to sub, sub, subordinate the villages to these urban mechanisms to the point of disqualifying in the, in independent rural slaughterers. The history of the mechanism for supervising kashrut and the adoption of the modern bureaucratic system in the halachic tradition are deeply rooted in the history of Eastern European Jews and the relationship between the Jews of the city and the Jews of the countryside. Thank you. Keeping your time limits. Without any intervention on my side. Um, our next speaker is Professor Yochanan Petrovsky Stern. Um, well, the, the bio is really short. The bio I received is really short. Uh, professor Yochanan Petrovsky Stern is a Crown Family Professor of Jewish Studies at the Department of History at the Northwestern University. But frankly, to say his name speaks for itself, so doesn't need really a long presentation, a long introduction. Please, Professor Petrovsky Stern, I'm turning to the camera. Stop sharing. Towards the audience, I'm stopping the share, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for joining us. Do you hear me well? Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's interesting that um, we do not have many halakhic decisions of uh, Rabbi Levitz of, of British, but uh, one of the very rare decisions uh, of his that we know um, is actually attributed to um, Shner Zalman Gmeli, who mentions that Rabbi Levitz uh, gave him one advice on one subject matter, and this one advice on one subject matter was actually a decision about the lungs of the kosher animal. So I know there is something. Something is going on in British uh, for for years that uh, you know uh, the um, problem of slaughtering uh, meat um, and uh, kosher slaughtering uh, has something to do with with the place um, and the people. Um, so um, let me let me share with you um, some of my um, uh, very preliminary and hypothetical ideas. Um, uh, regarding to the topic uh, that I tentatively call um, confessional and local. Just let me explain to you uh, what, uh, what I mean by that. Uh, over the last, uh, I would say, five, seven years, there is a new trend um, in the study of early modern, um, uh, early early modern, modern religious, religious trends. trends. Uh, emerging uh, from uh, the uh, 1520s uh, till uh, the late 18th century, and they include uh, the um, uh, religions, uh, sects, um, and uh, different um, heterodoxical groups uh, that were uh, by and large called uh, the uh, religion, uh, the, uh, the trends of religious enthusiasm. Um, uh, by confessional, uh, scholars of uh, um, early modernity usually call uh, Catholicism, or um, any kind of domineering uh, religion at that time in that in in that place. So, for uh, many uh, lands uh, of uh, uh, for many Germanic lands uh, that we call so uh, Ashkenaz, uh, this was uh, Catholicism, and of course uh, the rising uh, Lutheran creed uh, would be called local um, in opposition to confessional. For uh, let's say. Um, uh, Holland, uh, it would also be Catholic uh, in the um, uh, situation of Spanish domination. And uh, what happens in uh, Flandria, mostly in Flandria, is the rise of uh, Calvinism that would be, again, called local against confessional. So there is this um, interesting dichotomy that I would like to toy with today 
um, uh, pondering um, a, a question which is uh, very local, uh, very specific, and has something to do uh, with the rise of a Hasidic movement uh, in East Europe that I would also like to place um, in uh, the context of what we call confessional and what we call local. By confessional, in this particular case, I do not mean, of course, Catholicism. I mean um, uh, traditional Ashkenazic Judaism. And by local, I mean uh, the rise of um, uh, different uh, Hasidic centers um, in the territory of East Europe from the 18, from the 17th um, from the 1760s, 1770s, and um, until the late 18th century. So um, in order to give you a sense of uh, where I'm going and what I'm trying to do with this um, uh, application of, uh, of a general dichotomy of, um, East Europe, uh, of, of uh, um, early modern studies to uh, the specific case um, of the rise of Hasidic movement, I would like to share with you some of the um, um, also preliminary insights into the um, uh, life and deeds of Rabbi Levitsky of Berdichev. Um, what I managed to do um, over the last uh, five, seven years, um, I managed to contextualize and, and flesh out um, some of the um, ideas uh, that uh, we get uh, from the uh, authors of the volume uh, um, uh, about Levitsky that was published a couple of years ago uh, by... Um, um, a bunch of scholars uh, for which group I was also a part, and also from the um, interesting uh, observations of uh, um, Ham Lieberman and, um, and Israel Halpern. So uh, what, uh, what I would like to, uh, to share with you is um, what I would call a very much counterintuitive uh, biography of uh, Rabbi Levitsky of uh, We know from many rabbinic stories of the 18th and 19th century that there is such a rule. If you behave well, if you are uh, okay with the local community, um, if you publish a book, you know, something important for rabbinic tenure, uh, you would be promoted. And we know many stories of promotions uh, of um, uh, rabbinic scholars uh, from um, uh, Chacham um, Tzvi uh, to, um, uh, to um, uh, Jonathan uh, Eibeschutz, uh, who moved from smaller communities to bigger communities all the time uh, going up um, uh, after they established themselves firmly and got kind of um, good um, letters of recommendation from, lo uh, from local communities. Uh, something very different happened to Rabbi Levitskog. Rabbi Levitskog starts um, his career um, in uh, in a very small town that is difficult to find on the map, uh, which is called um, um, uh, Richiwul, uh, which is about forty three miles uh, to the north from Kozienice um, uh, in, in 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 Poland, and um, he gets the position uh, around uh, 1760, 1761, exactly when uh, the person known as uh, uh, Shmuel uh, Ish Horvitz who we know as Schmelke of Nikolsburg, uh, leaves uh, the position for Sinyava, and then he moves to uh, Mikulov, that would later be called um, Nikolsburg. So um, I can uh, reproduce um, um, my reconstruction of uh, the story, how uh, Rabbi Levitskog managed to get from uh, uh, Lubartov, where he married a very wealthy family, to um uh, to ritual um and if you are interested i will tell you stories about uh, that particular part of his life but what is important for us is this uh, rabbi levitskog um is is a very young person uh, he's uh, hardly 20 years old and um he got plugged to uh, uh, uh Hurwitz, to Schmelke of Nikolsburg again, before Schmelke of Nikolsburg becomes Schmelke of Nikolsburg. And um, when, um, uh, when the uh, rabbi of, of uh, um, uh, Richival uh, leaves uh, town, he gives his position to um, Rabbi Levitskog. It's the first rabbinic position of Rabbi Levitskog, and he is Mara de Atra. That is to say, he is the rabbi of the town. Um, uh, uh, the, we do not know anything whether he does or does not have um, a yeshiva there. Most likely he doesn't. If he does, uh, uh, it would be maximum two people. Uh, but we do not have any kind of um, um, uh, evidence that he had um, a yeshiva there that he was teaching. But what we do know that uh, uh, Richibol becomes a kind of a point of departure um, and for his career. Um, in uh, three and a half years, uh, the brother of Schmelke uh, leaves uh, the nearby town of Zelechov 
Um, and um, it's also important to remember that both uh, Richival and Zelechov are under the auspices of Lubomirsky family. So uh, uh, Rabbi Levitsko kind of uh, changes the place without changing the owners of the town, uh, which is also a story in and of itself. And I can explain why it is important. So Rabbi Levitsko uh, moves to Zelechov. And in Zelechov, uh, which is, uh, I would say, five to seven times bigger than uh, than uh, Richival, uh, he has his permanent position for about nine years, nine to 10 years. And uh, uh, Zhelechov becomes the place where Rabbi Vizkuk uh, develops his um, uh, kind of double appointment or self-appointed double appointment. He is uh, Mara Deatra, he is Ahbe Din, but he is also, um, uh, quite importantly, he starts um, uh, teaching um, uh, uh, Hasidic um, um, ideas, and he gets in trouble with local uh, Mitnagdim. We have uh, uh, very nasty uh, reports of local Mitnagdim who report Rabbi, Rabbi Yitzchak uh, to uh, the, um, um, I can't say centrally located communities, but they report him to, um, uh, to Brisk um, uh, and to Vilna, and uh, oh, most likely it is because of these reports um, uh, Avram Kassel-Boyan starts uh, uh, directly attacking uh, Rabbi Levitskog and um, uh, triggering uh, what would be called um, um, haramot um, against uh, Hasidic movement uh, that um, have a luminary presence of Rabbi Levitskog, uh, who is personally mentioned in this haramot. So uh, uh, Zhelechov is the place where Rabbi Levitskog uh, establishes himself. He lives there. He gets two tenures um, in town. And he is constantly under attack. And he, this attack is not only uh, verbal, but also physical. Again, um, I'm relying on uh, mitnagdic evidence because we do not have internal Hasidic evidence. Uh, we, in general, have very little information about uh, the life and deeds of Rabbi Levitskog before he comes to the Berdichev. And when he comes to Berdichev, we know nothing about him except that he is uh, a successful um, author of um, 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 Gdushat Levi and um, a very centrally located uh, rabbinic figure. So uh, what happens in Zhelechov is that under the impact, under the direct impact of um, local Mitnagdim, uh, the community uh, disrupts um, its um, uh, agreement with Rabbi Levitskog, and he has to move elsewhere. And uh, lo and behold, uh, so you are getting um, bad uh, reputation in the town where you were serving as um, as a scholar. Um, and instead of going to a smaller community um, as a kind of uh, uh, punishment, he gets to a much bigger community and moves uh, to uh, Pinsk, um, uh, where uh, he also becomes um, Avbeidin and uh, Mara de Atra. Um, the same situation happens in Pinsk. Uh, Pinsk is um, not only the town where Rabbi Levitskog is um, uh, teaching Hasidus, and uh, he is um, um, acting as a rabbinic scholar, he is attending to the entire community, he is traveling all the time. So um, one of the uh, important um, disagreements between me and my uh, uh, mentor, supervisor, um, uh, and failed co-author, uh, 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 Rabbi um, Avram um, Arthur Green, is that um, Art Green says that uh, Rabbi Levitskog is not a traditional tzaddik, and I am going with uh, the uh, authors of the recently published, well, relatively recently published huge book uh, about um, um, uh, history of, of Hasidism, um, edited by um, um, David Asaf, uh, um, uh, Martin Brodzinski, and others, and they are claiming that we are dealing with two different types of um, uh, tzaddikim before the uh, um, um, era of tzaddikim kind of starts uh, at the beginning of the 19th century. And these tzaddikim are either um, uh, um, either locally entrenched and they are sedentary, or they are traveling tzaddikim. And Rabbi Levitskog is exactly that type of a traveling tzaddik. Um, um, I reconstructed um, his uh, itinerary. I can just uh, read uh, one paragraph. I don't want to impose uh, 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 the written text on you, but um, uh, uh, let me just um, uh, give you an idea of what I'm talking about. In Pinsk, Rabbi Levitsky became a, quite a peripatetic figure. He, um, uh, um, uh, um, he travels uh, to um, uh, different um, communities um, all over um, Eastern Europe, and the physical map of his travels um, had never been addressed uh, or understood, although it is an um, indispensable part of his spiritual itinerary. 
So he traveled uh, from uh, Pinsk to uh, Lubartov and to uh, Rechivo. Um, uh, he uh, traveled to uh, Rovno. Um, uh, he went to Leipzig. Um, uh, he um, definitely traveled uh, from Pinsk to Warsaw in 1781, where he participated in a disputation with um, um, uh, Rabbi Katzenbogen. Uh, he traveled uh, uh, from Pinsk to Berdichev uh, to discuss his position there. Uh, then he was again um, uh, in Warsaw um, uh, during the Grand Sejm, and most likely he got there already from Berdichev. Um, he went uh, to uh, uh, Zhelyakov several times and to Markov. I don't know if he wanted to meet with Davidov Markov personally. It's kind of a joke in the side of my presentation. He also went to, Pl uh, to Ploinsk, uh, um, uh, about 100 kilometers to the north. Uh, from Warsaw, um, uh, he went to uh, Zlobin, um, uh, halfway uh, uh, between um, uh, Belarusian possessions of Chabad Lubavitch and um, uh, and um, Berdychev, where he had his uh, uh, son married uh, to the daughter of um, uh, Rabbi um, uh, Schneel Zalman. Um, he also went um, uh, to the south, and and he he was seen in Boguslav. Um, uh, I don't know if he uh, ever traveled uh, 720 uh, miles uh, from Berdychev or, or Pinsk to uh, Mikulov uh, to visit uh, Schmelke, who got him the, his first position. But at least, you know, that gives you an idea of, uh, of an itinerant um, 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 rabbi and rebbe who traveled, as we know from the uh, first-hand sources, with his... Um, um, uh, with his kuteri. So he had Pamalesh and Mata, and he was traveling with uh, quite a number of uh, people who, um, uh, who, who uh, followed him on a trip. So it, it is uh, what I would call uh, the Hasidic court on the move. Uh, you know, we have scholars um, in residence, we have scholars on the wheels. So I, I would say there is a Tzadik in residence and there is also Tzadik on the wheels. So this is Rabbi Levi So Pinsk um, is the um, uh, the town that uh, replicates in the career of Levitskik exactly what happened um, in um, uh, Zhelechov. Uh, the only thing is that in that particular case, we have uh, more evidence. Um, in addition to what uh, was published by Mordechai Nadav uh, in his uh, uh, majestic work on Pinsk, um, um, I can add um, uh, two more uh, court case, one more court case with two interesting documents uh, recently uh, found in Minsk archives uh, that outline uh, the conflict between Rabbi Levitskog and and local Kahal. And this conflict again is verbal; um, it is physical. Um, and um, in the midst of this conflict, uh, Rabbi Levitskog appears as a person who is defending um, uh, people who are supporting him, including his servant, who is, uh, for the reasons I cannot explain, uh, not allowed uh, to be present um, at the uh, meeting of the uh, Kahal in 1783-1784 uh, 1783, um, in, in Pinsk. Uh, is also, Rabbi Levitskog is um, uh, known as a person who defends uh, at least one person um, uh, who uh, became a victim of injustice uh, from the hands of Kahal and um, uh, several leaseholders. So Rabbi Levitsko goes against the Kahal and against uh, uh, the leaseholders of the town, uh, of, of, excuse me, of, 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 uh, of parts of uh, different uh, branches of um, Pinsk economy. Um, and um, uh, it is interesting that um, most likely uh, this court case um, is uh, the one uh, that uh, triggers the disruption of the um, agreement of Rabbi Levitsk uh, with the local Kahal. And he is uh, basically, according to different um, uh, um, uh, controversial um, um, witnesses, he's banished from town um, when he's out of town. And, um, oh, you know, uh, to his luck, uh, a week after he leaves uh, Pinsk, he's already on um, Maradeatra and Avbeid Din in Berdichev. So um, oh, what, what I should mention, um, in addition uh, to what I've said, is that, of course, Pinsk is much more important uh, than, uh, than Zhelechov. Zhelechov is much more important than uh, Rechivol. And Berdichev is, as we know from different sources, is a major rival of Pinsk. And um, uh, in the time when Rabbi Rebitska gets to Berdichev, uh, Pinsk is going down, Berdichev is going up, and Berdichev is... Um, in terms of its demography statistics and uh, in terms of its economic rise is on the rise. 
So um, um, the question that I was asking, and I was discussing this question with a, a number of my colleagues, including um, uh, Charles Stamper, who is present here, um, um, uh, I, I'm, ask, I'm asking a question. What is going on uh, with uh, the career of Robert W. Iskak? Again, um, uh, I can give you examples um, of the very successful careers of rabbinic scholars who were loved by the communities and who went up, uh, I don't know, from Yaroslav to, to, um, uh, to Prague. Uh, or from another uh, small community to a uh, triple community, uh, um, uh, Winsbach, uh, uh, Frankfurt, um, um, uh, and Altona. Um, um, there can be um, other uh, successful examples brought up. Uh, late in the 18th, early 19th century, I can bring examples of the um, uh, unsuccessful careers of people who were in trouble with communities and who had to leave and who could not establish themselves as uh, rabbinic as as rabbis of the communities um, elsewhere. Yosef uh, Yosef uh, of Polonia uh, is is one of the examples. We call him of Polonia. He was not a rabbi of Polonia. He was um, a, a sedentary rabbi uh, who was uh, living there after he was uh, banished from Shargrad, where he had been a uh, maradat and avbeidin. Um, uh, so um, with Levitskak, uh, we are dealing with a situation when uh, a rabbi is um, banished from towns, um, at least uh, you know from two, uh, from uh, Zhedechov and 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 Pinsk. And uh, every time he's banished from town, he's getting to a better uh, community and he's getting uh, to a better position. So I find it uh, quite uh, counterintuitive and quite interesting. It's it's like uh, think about this. Um, um, I'm teaching at Bunker Hill Community College in the United States, and I do bad things there, and I earn bad reputation, and I'm promoted, and I'm getting uh, to Tufts University. Uh, you know, I teach 10 years at Tufts. Um, I have a uh, bad reputation, um, and, and I'm in conflict with the authorities, and, and, and I'm uh, getting my next position um, at uh, Northwestern University. And, and at, after Northwestern University, uh, the same uh, situation, I, uh, you know, I'm in conflict with uh, the scholars here, uh, no Nobody likes me, I have to leave, and I'm going to Harvard. And I end my life 20, 20, teaching 25 years at Harvard. So that is that is a kind of a thing that you have to think about when we talk about this itinerary from uh, Rechivol to um, to uh, Zhelechov to, uh, to Pinsk uh, to Berdichev. And um, that particular itinerary um, is uh, uh, quite strange, uh, not only from the point of view of what we know about the structure of uh, rabbinic institutions at the time and how they work, but also from the point of view of what is going on elsewhere, what is going on around Levi Iskak. And I just wanted to, to, to mention that um, uh, not only the personal letters uh, that are written with an extremely scathing uh, uh, critique of Rabbi uh, Iskak deeds, uh, signed by Katzen Bogen, uh, not only um, um, uh, direct attacks, uh, attacks uh, sometimes um, uh, you know concealed, sometimes revealed, in uh, uh, the uh, works of uh, Mitnagdim such as uh, Zemira Ritzim, uh, where Rabbi Levitzkak is personally targeted, uh, but also Haramot. Uh, published uh, from 1772 till 1797. Um, um, uh, well, every two, three, four years, uh, they are reinforced, of course, because they do not work. That's why they are reinforced and they have to proclaim them again. But in many of them, uh, not only Rabbi Levitskik is mentioned by name, um, uh, which is a rare case um, in collectively addressed Haramot, uh, but also uh, uh, when he's not addressed, uh, some of the very typical features of his behavior that, again, I can't explain um, in, in greater detail in questions and answers, um, are mentioned. So um, uh, he is personally targeted and he moves up. So when I'm asking this question, uh, I would like to return to the um, framework that, um, that I mentioned at the beginning, the confessional and, and the local. Uh, what I believe is happening at uh, at the time, which needs to be brought back into the uh, picture, into the general picture of the rise of Hasidic movement, which has not been really done appropriately, uh, I think we have to uh, um, uh, think seriously about the repercussions of uh, the um, shutting down of Vat Arbaratzot in 1764, uh, uh, the dissolution of uh, uh, of um, Vaad uh, Lita uh, of the uh, Council of Lithuania um, and uh, the repercussions of what is going on. Uh, when we look at the map of uh, the itinerary of Rabbi Levitskak, we will see that, um, you know, 
with an exception of uh, of Berdichev, he is really going uh, over the map uh, of uh, what we call Poland Lithuania on the one hand and and uh, Ukrainian lands uh, on the other hand. Uh, so from today's perspective, he's kind of um, uh, a traveler who traverses um, different political boundaries. The only thing is at that time, uh, there are no political boundaries. There is a confessional boundary. And this confessional boundary is uh, uh, really not the boundary that we can trace. It's the boundary uh, between what uh, the, um, uh, let's say, um, um, Vaad uh, Lita is trying to control after the dissolution of um, uh, of Vaad Arbaratsot, and um, if you look at the places where the Haramot are uh, published, including Jelva, including including Brisk, you will see that uh, you know really uh, the Haramot are published by the communities that are trying kind of to send uh, an email message uh, outside uh, of their reach uh, in order to make sure that they reach out to Pinsk, that they reach uh, well Pinsk is part of this uh, of that uh, geopolitical. Um, uh, environment, but they are trying to 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 send uh, messages to other communities, including Bridichev, uh, telling them, uh, you know, uh, we are uh, going against uh, Rabbi Levitskak, we are going against the rising Hasidic movement, so do not take them. And at that point, what we are witnessing, and it is also important thing to realize, we are witnessing that the private Polish towns, uh, that are still private Polish towns after the first and after the second and after the third partitions of Poland, um, as I have shown in my immortal book, uh, The Golden Age Day, Shtetl, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the, the uh, private Polish towns are still there, and um, uh, they are acting as this local that goes against the confessional. So these are not Jews going against Jews. These are not necessarily, you know, Hasidic movement going against uh, the um, uh, traditional Ashkenazic Judaism. This is local going against confessional. This is what's going on across Europe. So everywhere in Europe, we see the same kind of a... Um, uh, of a model. And I believe what we have to discuss, what I have to discuss, what I would like to hear uh, uh, from you, um, uh, maybe your critique of that point, is that um, um, uh, the communities that are uh, kind of on the border of uh, the um, uh, geopolitical uh, sector that controls uh, the uh, communities in, in Eastern Europe, uh, they are um, uh, claiming uh, their local power over the confessional power. They are saying, you know, we are be we better know what to do and how to deal with uh, with our rabbinic scholars and, and how to promote them. And uh, they are basically not kowtowing to the um, uh, to what I call confessional uh, uh, authorities uh, that are uh, issuing haramot um, against uh, the rising Hasidic movement, including Rabbi Levitskog. And therefore, I think it is uh, one of the possible explanations why the person uh, who is um, under external pressure and uh, of the um, uh, of the uh, authorities representing the confessional and under the internal pressure uh, of, of the local representatives of this confessional is still able to move from Rechivol to uh, to Zelechov, to Pinsk, and then to Berdichev, which is um, oh, in the late 18th century, perhaps the most important um, East European uh, town to be uh, a, a rabbi of um, uh, e economically, socially, um, uh, in terms of uh, international connections and trade, um, and, and ends his uh, life here, and nobody banishes him from Berdichev um, oh, from uh, 1784 till the time he dies. Um, 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 1809. So uh, that is uh, uh, one of the possible answers to the uh, question about this um, counterintuitive um, itinerary of Rabbi Levitskog um, that uh, I was trying to share with you. Um, um, I am um, talking um, out of my memory, but I have 61, 62 page long paper in front of me. So if you're interested, I can I can read. Um, uh, if you have answer, if you have specific questions, I can read to you paragraphs from from this piece. Um, um, detailing what I've said. Thank you. Professor Petrovsky Stern, we are now turning Just to. Have a regular morning. Please, Yochanan. Yochanan, thank you so much. Yochanan from Pinsk or from Northwestern. Northwestern. Uh, now we are turning to our third speaker, Dr. Levi Kupel, who is originally, I'm reading your bio. Who is originally from I'm Melbourne? Let, let me you let me present you. Originally from Melbourne, Australia, teaches in the Law Faculty of Tel Aviv University and at the Bordes Institute of Jewish Studies in Jerusalem. 
His research focuses on legal history and interplays between Jewish legal writing and broader legal, intellectual, and cultural aspect, uh, contexts. He is today here with us to talk about an exciting new cartography project under the auspices of the Jewish Galicia and Bukovina organization. Um, okay, let me turn the camera. No, no, I can't stand it. No, just if Yochanan is watching. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> I haven't even started yet. <laughs> Not perfect, but there's a better. There's a request to do that again. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. oh. Okay. Oh. There are more tricks. Yeah. Stay away. <laughs> I'm actually very excited to be speaking after uh, Yochanan because I'm actually named after uh, Rabbi Levi Yitzchok of Berdichev. And uh, when I was a little boy growing up in Melbourne, there was an old woman who every time she would see me walking with my father, to the Beit Knesset, to the synagogue, would say, Or Blevi Yitzchok mi Melbourne! As if I was... And I grew up thinking that I was the same soul as Rabbi Levi Yitzchok of Berdicha, that I was a Gilgul of his neshama, that I had the same neshama, the same soul as him. And there are certain things that you carry with you your whole life. So uh, you hear this biography, whose biography really was it? But today I'm here... On behalf of my esteemed colleagues, and I'm excited to share with you an interim report about a project that many of the speakers at this conference are part of. I'm talking about the creation of an historical atlas that describes and depicts Galician and Bukovinian Jewry. This exciting project is being conducted under the auspices of the Jewish Galicia and Bukovina organization with the stewardship and the participation of scholarly leaders in many fields of research from various disciplines and from different corners of the globe. This is an opportunity for me to express appreciation on behalf of my co-editors to all those who have already made valuable contributions to this exciting undertaking, which, as you can see, is a significant project with much promise. Those of you who haven't handed in your uh, second edition, your second versions or first versions, we know we know who you are. <laughs> in the following minutes, I'd like to map out the project, uh, project, and I'll begin with the structure of the historical atlas. I'll then acknowledge challenges that we face in producing the atlas before sharing a snippet from my own research area, legal history, that demonstrates how mapping the region can help answer existing research questions, raise new questions and challenges, and provide alternative perspectives on what we already know. So the project began with a lively discussion and debate as to how to structure such an atlas. And the primary question was whether the atlas should be organized by topic or by historical period. Now, on one hand, a topical framework demonstrates trends over time of particular phenomena. Furthermore, trans-imperial phenomena in the, Jewish in the Jewish community, for example, the evolution of the Hasidic movement, may have been indifferent to the vicissitudes of changing borders. On the other hand, Galicia and Bukovina are actual moments in time. We can state when they were created, when their borders moved, and when they ceased to exist as political entities. In order to map the cultural and social elements on the, on the geopolitical landscape, a historical division would be more appropriate. So after much discussion and consultation with, ex with experts, it was decided to go with the historical division, albeit with appropriate adjustments. One of the reasons for this decision was a consideration of our target or, uh, readership. <coughs> Who is our potential audience? 
The truth is we're aiming for a wide and varied readership, accomplished academic scholars, as well as a general readership. This in turn has helped us consider how to formulate the entries. I can tell you that at our regular meetings over the past two years, the decision to use the historical frame rather than the topical frame continues to animate our conversations, not because it was the wrong decision, but because there's an opportunity cost that we need to take into account at every turn. Thus, the atlas will be comprised of five parts, divided according to the major historical periods of Galicia and Bukovina. From the earliest Jewish presence until the first partition of Poland in 1772, Habsburg rule, that is from 1772 until the end of the Great War, the interwar period, the Second World War and the destruction of European Jewry, and the aftermath of the Holocaust. Professor Nicholas Chrisman, a pioneer of GIS, Geographic Information Systems, famous, famously said, cartographers never get lost. They just do accidental field work. While my co-editors and I were never lost, there are various challenges that we need to contend with when mapping Galicia and Bukovina. Some challenges are relevant to large international projects that span different disciplines and different periods. And those of us who've worked on such projects in the past are well aware of the challenges, and I don't need to rehearse those hurdles. Allow me to highlight some of the challenges that are particular to this project. First, how do we tell the story of Galicia before the Austrian annexation? To what extent is the region merely part of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth? Or perhaps the region has a particular character or defined demographic or social features even before it was recognized as an independent political entity. Earlier today, we heard from uh, Tomasz about demographic differences between Eastern Galicia and Western Galicia even before Galicia was recognized as a political entity. I was listening. <laughs> Even if we are unable to identify particularly Galician phenomena in pre-Galicia, Galicia, nonetheless, Jewish life after 1772 was a continuation of Jewish life before the Austrian annexation, and at times was a reaction to the political changes that were wrought in 1772, 1793, 1795 and, uh, 79, 1795 and later. So the story of pre-Galicia, Galicia needs to be told. Second, how do we contend with outlying areas that were only part of Galicia for a short period of time? Are they part of the Galician story? Let me give one example. There are many interesting facets to the city of Zamosht. One unusual aspect of Zamosht is the fact that it had a Sephardic community, making it a Jewishly multicultural city. Is this part of the story of Galicia? To answer this question, we need to decide whether Zamosht it was part of Galicia. And this is not an easy question to answer. Zamosht was annexed by Austria and included in the crown province of Galicia after the first partition of Poland in 1772. Yet after the Austro-Polish War in 1809, Zamosht was annexed to the Duchy of Warsaw, a satellite state with, uh, of Napoleon with a thirst for Polish independence. That did not last long. With Napoleon's defeat, the Congress of Vienna transferred Zamosht to the Russian-controlled Kingdom of Poland. So for 37 years, Zamosht was part of Galicia. That's about a quarter of the history of Galicia. So to what extent should Zamosht feature as part of the story of Galicia? Good question. Third. Ah. Third. What does the term Galiciana signify after the First World War? Once there was no longer a geographic region that was legally and politically defined as Galicia. We heard earlier from 
from Vlada, where, from Lada, when she sighted Singa on the train, when there was no Galicia, but he still could see the border. So I grew up, as I mentioned, in Melbourne, Australia, and there were many Galicianas and Polish Yidin who were very proud of their distinct heritage as Polish or as a Galiciana. And while the old timers in Melbourne, mainly Holocaust survivors, had shed their Hasidic clothing, their children and grandchildren returned to the clothes of their grandfathers. The Galicianas wore a streimel on Shabbat, and the Polish wore a spodik. And it was only later that I realized that those survivors had been born in the same country, endured the Holocaust in the same way, and reached the shores of Australia in similar circumstances. So here's a further example of the blurring of borders. It's a play about Galicia, featured on a contemporary website dedicated to Polish Jewish cabaret. In preparing the historical atlas, we acknowledge these challenges and we grapple with them earnestly. To some extent, the atlas seeks to add nuance and understanding and to tease out the distinct features of Galicia and Bukovina and recount the unique stories of these significant Jewish communities. Let me now share with you one example of the potential contribution of the historical atlas. This particular example comes from my own area of expertise and interest, and it will appear in the entry dealing with the responsa literature during the Habsburg period, and it was uh, the entry, I worked on the entry together with Ellie Fisher. I believe that this example is a fine demonstration of the value of this historical atlas. Rabbi Yecheskel Landau is famous as Chief Rabbi of Prague, a position he held for almost 40 years from 1755 until his death in 1793. Yet Rabbi Landau spent the first 40 years of his life in pre-partition Poland. It appears that his most formative experience was the decade he spent studying in the prestigious Cloys in Brody, meaning that he was an intellectual product of the region that would become Galicia. And earlier today, we heard from Natalia about the importance of uh, Brody. Today, as we, as we will presently see, Galicia is connected to Rabbi Landau's legacy, not just his educational journey. Rabbi Landau is famous for his responsa, that is, written legal answers in response to halachic questions addressed to him. Rabbi Landau has been termed a super rabbi for the broad reach of his responsa as he addressed questions from near and far. These responsa are preserved in two volumes. The first that was printed in his lifetime in 1776, and the second that was printed posthumously by his son in 1811. Those who study the responsa of Rabbi Landau pay scant attention to differences between the volumes. The first difference is sheer numbers. The first volume contains 256 responsa, and the second volume includes twice as many responsa. That's not necessarily surprising. It's entirely possible that with time, the stature of the chief rabbi of Prague grew and more people turned to him with questions. A more significant difference between the volumes emerges when we map the metadata of the responsa. Rabbi Landau was careful to preserve the location of his addressees. If we plot those addresses on a map for the first volume, an image of a trans-imperial legal authority emerges. Questions were sent to Rabbi Landau from all over, from the old Jewish communities in the Rhine Valley up to the North Sea coast in the west, from Constantinople in the southeast, from Rabbi Landau's former places of residence in Galicia in the east to the Baltic coast in the northeast. There's even a more surprising phenomenon that cannot be seen on this map. The first addresses mentioned in each one of the four sections of the volume 
lie on or near the borders of the geographic extent of his correspondence. Let me explain that. The first section, the book is divided into four sections, and the first section opens up with responsa to Bonn, Hamburg, and Verona, reflecting the western border of his influence. The second section in the first volume introduces Emden on the North Sea coast. The third section starts with, with responsa to Timisoara, then the capital of the Habsburg province of Banat of Temeswar, as well as as put in the northern reaches of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, today Latvia, and Brody along the eastern part of his correspondence. The fourth and final section of that vo of volume one returns to Verona, and that city includes 23 responsa. That's 10% that are, of his responsa are sent to Italy. As you can see from the map, this is an impressive spread, one befitting the chief rabbi of Prague and a towering figure like Rabbi Landau. Now, we would expect that Rabbi Landau's popularity and his stature would grow with time. Yet, when we map volume two, an, an anomaly emerges. Rabbi Landau's addresses cover a smaller territory. The density is also different. More responsa were sent to the old Habsburg lands of Bohemia, Moravia, Silesia, and Western Hungary. These were the regions of Rabbi Landau's colleagues and where his disciples were serving as rabbis. It seems, therefore, that Rabbi Landau's popularity actually diminished over time. During the first 20 years of his rabbinate in Prague, he was asked questions from all over. Whereas in the following 20 years, it was, seems to be that it was only his disciples who asked him questions. Now, let me stop for a moment and note that this observation is a scholarly achievement of the historical atlas. So Elie Fisher has plotted this because of the, for, the, uh, for the historical atlas, and it's something that had not been noted previously. Now, of course, the observation is only the first stage. We've got a great observation. We need to offer a plausible explanation for the difference. Are all the responses in the second volume written chronologically? It's a good question. After the response. Those that have dates. Pardon? The ones that have dates. Are all written after. Okay, that's a... The ones that have dates. So, again... This is a, an achievement, and for this, the atlas says something. Now it's our job to, we've, we've got this great observation that the cartographic information has provided us. What, how can we explain that? And the suggestion that we're suggesting, or the explanation that we're suggesting in the atlas brings us back to the history of Galicia. First, we noticed that volume two is reflective of a typical geographic spread of responsa meaning halakhic decisions are sent to colleagues and to disciples in a limited geographic area that approximates geopolitical or ethnic boundaries. That, asser asset, that assertion was arrived at by mapping other collections of responsa which are beyond the scope of my presentation today. The anomaly, therefore, was actually, which volume? First. The first volume is the anomaly. Now, volume one was printed in Prague in 1776. That's a mere four years after the Austrian Empire first annexed parts of Poland and dubbed its new acquisition Galicia. In the same year, 1776, the Empress Maria Theresa instituted the office of the Chief Rabbi of Galicia. Rabbi Landau was the leading candidate for the position. And the empress, it appears, was in favour of his candidacy. After two years of negotiation, Rabbi Landa would eventually not assume the position. As it would turn out, the position of chief rabbi of Galicia was not an enduring office. It was filled by a lesser light, and after less than a decade, it was abolished in 1787 and never restored. But in 1776... Rabbi Landau was still campaigning, campaigning for the position. 
his collection of responsa could therefore be, be viewed as a prospectus displaying not only his legal acumen, but also his popular authority. His, con his, his conscious decision to include metadata may have been a subtle message to his readership. It's as if he's saying, look how far and wide I'm recognized as an authority in Jewish law. Surely I'm a worthy ca candidate to be the chief rabbi of Galicia. Perhaps we could even add a note about the title of the, the collection, Noda Bihuda, meaning known in Judah. The phrase comes from Psalms, God is known in Judah. His name is great in Israel. In his introduction, Rabbi Lando explained that he named the book in honor of his father, whose name was Judah. It was Yechezkel, the son of Judah, who was known. There was, of course, a second meaning. Rabbi Lando was known in Judah, meaning he was known amongst his fellow Jews far and wide. But in the verse, known in Judah refers to God. We must wonder whether appropriating a term that described God, that described God was a grandiose move that was part of his candidacy for Galician chief rabbi. A final word about new frontiers. When we began work, we originally thought that we'd start with print versions in English and in Hebrew, followed by a digital version. It's since become clear to us that the order needed to be switched. With that in mind, let me conclude with a word about, the, about some new vistas in cartography. Albert Einstein is famously quoted as saying, you can't use an old map to explore a new world. We all know that we live in a new world. New tools are available to us that can represent data in innovative ways. Our students are part of that new world. So we cannot just use static maps. To borrow the words of the great Scottish writer, Robert Louis Stevenson in his Treasure Island, nowadays it's not good enough to say X marks the spot. The map needs to be interactive and dynamic with the ability to overlay different sets of data. One frontier that we hope to explore is immersive maps that are, and other cartographic tools that are being developed as we speak. This ambitious project, the historical atlas of Galicia and Bukovina, seeks to provide new maps for the new world which we inhabit. And I'm sure that you join me in looking forward. Thank you. I genuinely believe that someone from Melbourne puts the picture of the Sydney Opera. <laughs> Isn't it that totally worthless? When you're that far away, it doesn't really. It's, then, then you can feel the. It's still part of where you come from. <laughs> Unbelievable, but impressive. <laughs> No, we have... Even you are impressed. No, I would I never use the picture of Moscow. You know, it's like this <laughs> <laughs> book. Disregarding the current events and speaking about the broader context. Anyway, we have 12 minutes for Q and A, which is a lot of time. I'm coming back to the Zoom. Uh, so. Raise your hands and ask your questions. Some of she's in Galicia or not? I can't uh, wait for the answer. Well, yeah, what's, what's about what's about Zama? I love the city also. That's why we keep we keep having arguments about it. So what we're going to do? It was in Galicia for ten percent of the time. You have to wait for the atlas to see what was decided. <laughs> You know, it's very important to... Uh, I will reveal the secret to you. Okay. Private. <laughs> I, think that the, I think that part of the answer is that we will, uh, we will include it because it's for 37 years, but we can't see it as a major part of the story because it's only 37 years, 10%. So we have to somehow try to finesse that in the way we're going to present the, uh, the atlas. I, I think I should acknowledge that there are sitting around, and many of you are contributors, and uh, Dr. Yudit Kalik, is, uh, is one of the editors, and uh, Ilya, Dr. Ilya Lori is, uh, is the managing uh, force. 
behind the project, so uh, I speak on their behalf as well. I hope you're all right with that. Yeah. <laughs> Feel free to add something if you want, if you think I missed something out. I have a question. Well, it's very technical, basically. How is it going? Is it going to be published? I think we discussed that, but like, it was going. Is it, is it going to be printed or only kind of available online? Like, because there is the evil encyclopedia, which can. Step by step. And what are, what are the steps? I think first step is that Alex has to give in his article. Yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just finish with the conference, and then I'll. <laughs> When I come, when I come, first thing I when I come home. Any other questions? Please. Okay, that's the last session. I think that people are saturated, although there were really fascinating presentations on this specific session and during the whole conference. Uh, as I said before, like when we opened the conference yesterday, I promised to give, I promised to you that, that I'm going to give the, the closing remarks. So I didn't really prepare something long because I knew that people are going to don't need to focus on me. Yeah, it's not really important. It's your concluding remarks. I'm yeah, I'm giving the concluding remarks. First of all, the most important remarks is uh, remark or group of remarks is to thank the center. Thank uh, Adi and Sarah, who is not here now, but he, she spent a long time here and again uh, bringing food, thank you for building tables. Grabbing chairs, it was wonderful a wonderful organization. Except for preparing the tasty food we had. It's like, it was wonderful. Thank you. I wish to thank our director, Ronnie Schnauber, who is in America, I guess, but yes. his heart is with us. Uh, that is an important thing. I think that the most important outcome for myself and for Judith, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that. Two important scholars told us that transimperial is a valid term. In the morning, an important demographer said us, told us that it was a question about this term, but his data proved that there is something about it. And in our last session now, an important scholar of the Galician jury told us that there was something transnational, transimperial, transnational is boring, transimperial in the response of Anuda Bayuda. So transimperial is playing its role. And speaking of imperial, actually we live in a, when I was a PhD student and like in the last, not in the last, but in, like in, during the 10 years before 2022, I felt that I'm work, it's very convenient to work with the imperial paradigm. The empire was a simple question to contesting, because to contested national narratives, it was a very convenient framework to discuss or to avoid difficult questions. Um, after the Russian aggression in Ukraine, which actually takes place in places that we all are, all are addressing, some, some of us personally and some of us not impersonally, but from afar, the question of national versus imperial takes a different shape. Um, I believe our sympathy now is very clearly on, a, on the side of a national struggle engaged in a modern, a modern a purpose or postmodern imperial force. And when we started organizing this conference, and basically when every time when, when I think about the, the East European Jewish and non-Jewish history I'm working on, the question of, of the empire um, appears again in a different light. Because it's, it's not really easy to disregard or, 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 or to argue with national narrative. And as Professor Batal said, there are it's problematic because there are many contradictions between, or potential contradiction, contradictions between the national narratives, between the Jewish and the Ukrainian, between the Jewish and Belarusian, Jewish and Lithuanian, Jewish and Russian, etc., etc., etc. But as a, what I'm glad to see here is that despite the tensions, that despite the problems, and despite the problem, the kind of the, the new problem we have with the term of or the notion of the empire, the work is still fruitful. And there is a lot of potential of dialogue and a fruitful discussion of the interrelations between imperial and national narratives. And well, the Russians, didn't, the Russians, the contemporary Russians didn't manage to spoil it, at least in my eyes. And uh, what they can congr what they can wish to all, all of us, that we will be able to use the imperial paradigm only as a more or less distant history. And our future as scholars as, as an, and as human beings was 
will be free of imperial forces and imperial uh, struggles or whatever. Yeah. So thank you so much for coming here. It was a pleasure to seeing you all here. Thank you. Judy, thank you for thank organizing you. the largest part or the, the, the most of this conference. You can thank each other. I think yeah. we, all of us can thank the two of you for giving us the opportunity mm -hmm. to come together. Yeah, thank you.